Fire Emblem Three Houses is my favorite game I have ever played. I had first discovered this game on a Nintendo eShop in June of 2021 after it went on sale. I had no familiarity with the Fire Emblem franchise, and based on reading the description on the store page, it just looked like a medieval Harry Potter game. And that sounded very appealing to me, so I pretty much went in with absolutely no knowledge of what I was about to play. I proceeded to play the game over the course of a month and a half, finishing my first playthrough, at around 40 hours. I did several more playthroughs after that first one, to a point where I now have 445 hours of total gameplay. Fire Emblem Three Houses captivated me to a point that no game had done before, and I can say with absolute certainty that this is my favorite game I have ever played. And I want to take this time to explain just how much this game means to me. That being said, I think I should get this out of the way first. This will be full of spoilers from the beginning to the end. This is absolutely a game I believe warrants playing the game blind. So if you have yet to play it or finish it, I highly recommend you go do so before continuing on. This will be a very full retrospective going over everything I like about it and everything I don't. Yes, I have a very strong emotional attachment to this game, but I also have some strong words about some of the decisions made. But for those of you that want to watch it anyway, I'll do my best to make it understandable for you. After this introduction section of the game where I go over the main premise and any little bits of information that I think you need to know, it will be split into 8 chapters. The first chapter going over the cast and characters of Three Houses. The second chapter will be about gameplay in the game's central hub, the monastery. The third chapter being about combat. The fourth chapter will be everything to do with the game's presentation. And the final four chapters will be about different sections of the story. If you liked the video here today and want to see more Fire Emblem content in the future, please like and subscribe. This video took a lot of time to make, so I would really appreciate it. But now that that's done, let's get into Fire Emblem Three Houses. Oh my. What could have brought you here? When the game begins, you are introduced to your player character. You can change the name, gender, and birthday of this character, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to call him Byleth, and his gender will be male. Now, there are some very peculiar things about Byleth that are brought up right away. First off, Byleth has recurring dreams about a war that took place a long time ago, always seeing a fight with an old man, and a green-haired woman. In the dream, the woman wins, violently killing the man who she clearly has heavy animosity towards. A war like that hadn't happened in a very long time, so it's very weird that Byleth will have recurring dreams about it. Another weird thing is that Byleth has someone living inside his head. He can talk face to face to her in dreams, and even while he's awake, she'll often chime in and tell him how she's feeling. Personality-wise, she's very bratty, but it's clear that she's more than just some kid. Though neither Byleth nor her knows who she really is. The last thing immediately noticeable about Byleth is that he's very unemotive. He can talk, but he doesn't really have a voice and doesn't show any emotion. Those are just some things I want to bring up now, as they will definitely be important later. After talking to the girl in your head for a little bit, your father will wake you up. The two of you are traveling mercenaries currently in a village called Remire, and are about to go out on a job. Before you're ready to leave though, you are summoned out by one of the mercenaries in your troop, as you need to protect three students that are being chased by bandits. Fighting the bandits gives the player their first experience at combat. During the battle, you fail to protect the white-haired woman named Edelgard, and Byleth almost gets killed before the girl in his head stops time. She remembers her name to be Sothis, and gives you the power to rewind time so you can save Edelgard while also not dying in the process. So, with this newfound power, Byleth does just that. After managing to repel the bandits, Byleth learns that the students he just saved are more than just normal students. In fact, each of the three students is a respective heir to the region they come from. The white-haired woman is named Edelgard. She is a very firm and unflinching woman, and she is set to be the future emperor of the Adresian Empire. The blonde man is named Dimitri. He's very kind and proper, and he is said to be the future king of the Kingdom of Fargus. The last heir is named Claude. Compared to the other two, he is much less serious and more laid back, and he is said to be the eventual leader of the Leicester Alliance. The Empire, Kingdom, and Alliance make up the country of Fodlan, which is where this game takes place. Each of the three are very impressed with Byleth's fighting ability and invite him to work for their region. 
They all ask Byleth which of the three regions he'd want to work for, but before that can happen, Byleth and his father Geralt are invited back to the monastery where the three go to school. Geralt actually used to be a knight for the school, and he is very hesitant to go back. But, seeing no other option, Geralt and Byleth go back to the monastery. When they reach the monastery, they are introduced to Rhea, the leader of the school and the church that runs it. She is very impressed with what she heard about Byleth's fighting ability, so she reinstates Geralt as a member of the Knights of Saros, a group of knights that work for the church, and she instates Byleth as a teacher. She explains that there was a vacancy in one of the teaching spots, so she allows him to choose one of three houses that he can teach. A very odd choice, considering Byleth would be about the same age as the students he'd teach. She invites him to introduce himself to the members of the school, and see which house he'd be the most interested in teaching. His options are the Black Eagle House, the one that Edelgard leads, made up entirely of members of the Empire. The Blue Lion's House, led by Dimitri, is made up entirely of members of the Kingdom. Or he could lead the Golden Deer House, led by Claude, which is made up of students all from the Lesser Alliance. You get the opportunity to talk to every single student and kind of get a first impression of them, as well as being able to talk to some of the faculty. Once you're done talking to all the students, you have to make the most crucial choice of the game. Which house do you want to lead as professor? This is a very crucial choice that will determine how the rest of the game will go. There is no correct choice either. The choice is entirely based on which set of students you like the most. Making your choice between the Black Eagles, Blue Lions, and Golden Deer marks the end of the introduction to three houses. When I think of my favorite introductions to games, this is by far one of my favorites. So much information about the characters and story you are about to experience are introduced and set up within a very short amount of time. It's very engaging and well-paced, and it manages to have the most important choice you'll make within the first hour. Since we're at the end of the intro of the actual game, you might think it's time to move on and talk about characters. Yet, there is still some stuff I want to talk about now, so I don't have to bring it up later. Let's now talk about the quest system. In Three Houses, this information is spread out pretty sporadically in the first half of the game. But crests are a very important topic if you want to understand a lot of the characters, and it's even spursed in with the gameplay, so I think it's really important to bring up now. So, what are crests? Crests are basically part of someone's bloodline. If you have it, you are often of a noble family, and you'll be very highly respected by the world at large. Having a specific crest allows you to wield what is known as a hero's relic. There are incredibly powerful weapons that are said to be descended down from the goddess. Having a crest is a pretty sweet deal, but the problem is with people who don't. Commoners almost never have crests, so they don't really have any power of their own within a larger society and nobles value crests so much that they're willing to shun out anyone who doesn't. You actually get to see this firsthand early on in the story, when you and your house goes to fight a disgraced noble with no crest that stole the hero's relic. Crests are a very important topic for a lot of the characters of the game. Many of them have dealt personally with the problems that the crest system brings, either the problems of not having one, or the heavy pressures that come with having a crest. Each character has a different idea on how they think the crest system should be changed for the better, including the three main lords, Edelgard, Dimitri, and Claude. And that's pretty much a basic rundown of the topic. There's definitely more to bring up, but since a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about are specific details about the story, I think I should stop here. Hopefully you have a good basic understanding about what the crest system is. Three Houses is undoubtedly a massive game. There's a lot of concepts that are crucial to understand the overall narrative. The country of Fodlin has a lot to break down, so I think now is the perfect time to add on to that, by talking about Fire Emblem Three Houses' cast of characters. The strength of Three Houses is undoubtedly within its characters. Most of the good things that this game does is due to its incredible cast of characters. First off, there are a lot of them. If we just include the playable characters from the Three Houses and the Faculty, that is still well over 40. And that list doesn't even include Sothis or Rhea, who are two of the most important characters in the entire game. Point is, there are a lot of characters to get to know. And with a cast that big, you wouldn't expect the individual characters to be that great. 
there are plenty of games that have big casts, where most of the characters within it are very uninteresting. But somehow, someway, Three Houses manages to have a cast that has a lot of depth within their personality and character goals. Sure, when you first meet them, they seem like the standard tropes. The overzealous noble, the bratty kid, or the whiny recluse. But as you interact with them more and more over the course of the game, 9 times out of 10 you will realize that the characters are much more down to earth than they initially appear. Basically, every character in the game has a specific reason for why they do the things they do. The reasons given are so well written that you can understand where the characters are coming from and you want them to succeed. And since Three Houses is split into different paths, you're only going to be able to talk to a specific amount of students with each playthrough. This makes it easier to get to know specific students, while also not overwhelming you with the game's large cast. So, in actuality, instead of 40 characters you're going to be talking a lot to over the course of the game, it's more like 10 to 15. I think that's really smart and bolsters the game's replayability and helps you get attached to more characters. At this point, I want to highlight some of the characters that spoke most to me personally. If I wanted to, I could talk about all 40 plus characters, but if I were to do that, that would make this video even longer than it already is. Instead, I'll just highlight some of my favorites. I'll cover three from the Black Eagle House, three from the Blue Lions, two from the Golden Deer, two from the Church of Saros, and then finishing off talking about the main characters. So, I'm still covering around 15. Let's start off with the characters in the Black Eagles. The first one I want to highlight is Ferdinand von Eyre. He is a noble from the Eyre family, the future Prime Minister to Edelgard to rule as Emperor, and he's very proud of that. He is definitely a very proud noble. What makes Ferdinand very interesting to me is that although he's a big supporter of the nobility, he is very much unlike the other noble first nobles that you meet in the game. Basically, he's not like his father. I think Ferdinand is a very strong contrast for Edelgard because although he's very proud, he tries to see things from both sides of the argument. And he also has a very kind and likable personality, even if he can be a bit over competitive. The second Black Eagle I want to highlight is Bernadetta. Like I lightly alluded to earlier, Bernadetta is initially portrayed as your typical recluse. Very shy and antisocial to the point of being scared of people. Much like Florina in Fire Emblem 7. And Bernadetta is definitely like this, but the game does a really good job of giving you a reason on why she's like this. Because Bernadetta is very extreme on the antisocial bits of her personality. The reason she's like that is, to some extent, because of her noble lineage. Her father is a very greedy noble that only really views her as property of the noble house. And since he wants to immediately marry her off to another noble, he would tie her to a chair until she learned to stop talking, all so that he could prepare to be the perfect wife in his eyes. He actually almost killed one of the only friends she had when she was little. All of that gave her a form of PTSD that makes it really hard for her to talk to people. Her main character arc is about making friends at the monastery so that she can gradually try to open up more. She really improves with the social aspect as the game progresses, but what I really appreciate is that there's no moment where she just flips a switch and stops being shy. Because with the abuse that the game laid out that she went through, I would be kind of upset if she suddenly had a complete character shift. Luckily, she doesn't have that happen, but she does get better. Her character arc is very strong, and it's a big reason why she's one of my favorite characters in this game. The last Black Eagle I want to highlight is Dorothea, the only commoner in the entire Black Eagle house. At first glance, Dorothea only seems to be at the monastery to marry herself off to a rich noble, a fact she herself admits, and is shown off with her overly flirtatious and often shallow personality. Of course, this turns out to be merely a facade. Although Dorothea is only at the monastery to marry herself off, she's doing it out of self-hatred rather than a wanting for status. She's a very strong hatred of the nobility. Her reasoning for this is because of people like her father, who tossed her and her mother aside when it was inconvenient to him, or when nobles would give a false sense of kindness to her only because she was a member of the opera company. Those same nobles she states used to spit at her when she was an orphan in the street. All of those events in her life gave her a very strong bias against nobles. She holds grudges against people like Lawrence and Ferdinand, even if they're not like the other nobles she's met. 
Because of her time being homeless, she has a lot of self-doubt about aging. One of her biggest fears is about getting too old so that the opera company wouldn't find her useful anymore, and that she would be right back where she came from, living on the streets of the Imperial capital. What I like about Dorothea's character a lot is that she has two major things she needs to work through, her hatred of the nobility and her self-doubt. Neither of those plot lines are immediately apparent when you meet her character, and she has some of the most amount of character growth compared to the rest of the cast. In addition, to that great character arc, she also has probably my favorite line of dialogue in the main story. I'm not gonna spoil it now, but you probably will be seeing it later on in the video. Back when I started this channel two years ago, Dorothea was probably one of my favorites. She's not nearly as high in the list of my favorites as she used to be, but she's still an amazing character. Let's move on to my favorites of the Blue Lion's House, starting out with Ingrid. She is a noble of House Galatea, a very crucial house for the Kingdom of Fargus. Her biggest goal while coming to the monastery is to become a great knight that could lead the kingdom well. While she always had been like that, her longing to be a chivalrous knight had only increased after the death of her fiancé. Her fiancé was named Glenn, and he died in a tragedy that also claimed the lives of several important kingdom people, including Dimitri's father and stepmother. That event, called the Tragedy of Dusker, affected numerous people inside the kingdom, including Ingrid. So, she wants to be the best knight she can be. Ingrid, unfortunately, has a grudge against the people she believed caused it. The tragedy was blamed on the neighboring country of Dusker, leaving Ingrid to have a hatred of anyone who comes from that country. Obviously, she shouldn't be like that, as not everyone in Dusker was involved in the tragedy, and although she definitely shouldn't have a hatred for everyone in Dusker, the game does a good job of showing that it all stems from Glenn's death, and they don't vilify her for it. And her character arc has her letting go with a lot of that, while also becoming a great knight for Fergus. And I think she's an interesting character for that. The next character I want to talk about is someone going through largely the same situation that Ingrid is, and that character is Felix. He is a noble of House Fraldarius, which is arguably the most important house to the kingdom. Felix doesn't really care about the title, though. Felix's personality is very brooding. He cares more for sword fighting and getting better at that, rather than talking to the rest of the students. Deep down, Felix is still a caring guy, but he finds much more respect in people that are competent when it comes to combat and he prefers to hide his emotions. The tragedy of Dusker also strongly affected Felix. Ingrid's fiancé is actually his older brother. Unlike Ingrid, though, Felix became very cold when it comes to the nobility. He doesn't hate them for the same reason someone like Dorothea would, but he hates their concept of chivalry, as after Glenn died, his father glorified his death, calling him a true knight, even though his death was not glorious at all. This led to a very strained relationship between Felix and his father, as well as a relationship between Felix and Dimitri, as watching Dimitri in combat has led Felix to believe that Dimitri has lost it, calling him the Boar Prince, calling him that based on the erratic behavior he displays while fighting enemies. Of course, that's only partially true, as Felix still has a strong loyalty to Dimitri, but his friendship with him definitely isn't the best. As a character, I can definitely tell that he's not everyone's cup of tea, but I just find him so interesting. He is one of my top characters in the entire game, just because he has so much going on. Despite having the brooding, sword fighter type personality, he is honestly one of the most human feeling characters in the entire game. And that's saying a lot, because a lot of the characters in this game are very human feeling. The last blue lion I want to highlight is Sylvain, another important noble from the kingdom. Sylvain is kind of the inverse of Dorothea's character. Sylvain is also a very flirtatious noble, even being described by Dimitri as being a skirt chaser at the beginning of the game, even more so than Dorothea. Three Houses even shows this off mechanically. If you are a female Byleth and in any other house, you can recruit Sylvain for free and he can have a conversation with just about every female character. Sylvain, though, is very aware of how he acts. Although Sylvain will definitely go on dates with a lot of women over the course of the game, he knows full well that he's not going to end up marrying them. He hates a lot of the women he goes out with because he feels like they're only dating him for his crest and his lineage. 
Most of the time, he's right. He's seen firsthand what happens to a member of his family that doesn't get born with a crest, being shunned out of the family, and being viewed as worthless. So he just assumes that any woman that goes out with him is only in it to bear a child with a crest and join a noble family. He outwardly states that he hates them for that. And honestly, that's what surprised me the most about him. It shows a different perspective of the nobility. Instead of showing how the nobles are bad, because of the crest system, it shows how hard it is for some of the nobles due to that same system. And I find that really interesting. Most of the good characters we've covered so far have been people that have disdain for the nobility. But although Sylvain's definitely not a huge fan of the system, it can also show how the greed with crest can cut both ways. How some of the commoners will just try to go after someone with a crest, just for the power that it brings. And that makes Sylvain a very good character. The last set of students is the Golden Deer. I have two students I want to highlight here, which is less than the other two houses, because to be honest, as you'll see as this video goes on, the Golden Deer aren't exactly my favorite. I don't dislike them in any way, but compared to the other houses, they simply just aren't as good. But the two characters I'm about to talk about are, starting out with Lysithia. She is a noble, but of a minor house, at least compared to the other nobles of the Alliance. She is the youngest student in the entire school, making her kind of bratty and always striving to be the best she can be. The main reason she's at the monastery is so she can learn as much as she can so that when she graduates, she can relinquish her family's noble ties. She wants to hurry up and get a jump on that, as when she was a child, she was experimented on for her crest. These dark experiments, while giving her a second crest, vastly reduced her lifespan and took all the pigment from her hair. So she wants to relinquish the powers of her noble house so that no one in her family has to go through what she went through ever again. I think the reason I like Lysithia so much is because her character motivation is one of the best in her house. I believe it also adds a lot to her character as it shows a more mature side of an otherwise childlike character. Marianne is the last member of the Golden Deer that I want to highlight. At first glance, you might think Marianne is very similar to characters like Bernadetta or Lysithia. And although it's true that Marianne shares some of the personality traits of those two characters, being a very antisocial character with a lot of crest issues, but I feel like that would be doing her character a disservice, as I actually prefer her character to the two I just mentioned. Her antisocialness stems from her crest. Her situation is unique though. Unlike other crests where everyone would die to have one, hers is called the Crest of the Beast, stemming from a man who had the crest that turned into a monster. She's tried her best to keep it secret from people, but to no avail. She is lambasted by crest scholars calling her a monster, and in general has not been treated well at all. Worse still, she believes in the story about her crest being cursed. So she separates herself from as much people as she possibly can, worrying that if she becomes too close to people, they will end up suffering for it. It gets so bad to the point where she ends up praying to the goddess to take her away to heaven. Marianne is honestly one of the most sad characters in the game, but that only makes her character arc where through the help of her friends, she realizes that her lineage is now a curse on herself, and that she shouldn't hate herself for her bloodline, that much sweeter. Her storyline is very touching, and I think she's the best member of the Golden Deer by a landslide. That is all the students I wanted to cover, but I'm not going to move on to the main characters yet, as there is a couple members of the faculty I want to talk about. Starting out with Rhea's right-hand man, Sedith. To be honest, I could probably count Sedith as one of the main characters, but since I'm already talking about 15 of them, I'm not going to bump that number up on a technicality. Anyway, the reason I like Sedith so much as a character is because he shows a much more down-to-earth side of the Church of Theros. Although there's definitely a lot of good within that organization, but as you'll see when we cover the story later, the church definitely makes some questionable decisions. Regardless of any of that though, Sedith is still a really good person. When it comes to character flaws, the biggest one that Sedith has is his overprotectiveness when it comes to his sister slash daughter Flame. That probably sounds really weird if you have no idea what I'm talking about, but to the general public, Sedith and Flame are brother and sister, but in actuality, he is her father. This is all for Flane's sake, as it's best to protect her. Sedith can be very overbearing when it comes to Flane's safety, so his main character arc goes through that. I don't think it's one of the strongest character arcs in the game, but the relationship between Sedith and Flane is so well done, I don't really think it matters as much. Another thing I really liked about Sedith is that when the writers have him be a guiding character for other students, it often makes for a great storyline or scene. 
Hanneman is one of the three major professors, and he is a resident Crest Scholar of Garrick Mock. To be honest, I used to not be a big fan of his character. He always seemed a little bit creepy to me. A lot of his scenes with students have him prodding them about their crest, and if those students are hesitant to reveal the secret natures of their crests, he'll just keep pushing in the name of research. And some of his supports were kind of weird, like the one with Dorothea. But then, on one playthrough I did, I decided to get the final Hanuman support I'd yet to complete, the one with Edelgard, and that completely changed my opinion of his character. Hanuman is originally from the Empire, so that's why Edelgard's support with him goes into a lot of his backstory. I have talked about this support in a previous video, but basically it explains that Hanuman is a former noble who decided to leave his house after the death of his sister. She ended up dying because of her lack of a crest, so Hanuman decided to go to Garrick Mock as professor where he could study crests to his heart's delight. Also, he can hopefully discover a method where anyone can get a crest, so because everyone has one, the value of obtaining a crest would not be as substantial. So therefore, nothing that happened to his sister would ever happen again. And that really speaks to something I really like about a lot of the side characters. You might have a perceived notion about what you expect these characters to be, but putting in a time to interact with them more can bring entirely new understandings of the character. And I think that's something Three Houses is spectacular at. I still have a few characters I want to talk about, and I've saved the best for last. The ones that drive the entire narrative, Edelgard, Dimitri, Claude, Rhea, and Byleth. Let's start with the future Adressian Emperor, Edelgard. Edelgard is a character very much defined by her ideals. In fact, her ideals are so strong that they spark the entire second half of the narrative, but I suppose it's getting ahead of myself. During much of the early game, Edelgard is very restrained when it comes to sharing her worldview. At most, she'll ask you vague questions about various aspects of the world that you do not understand, or she'll make a mention of big future plans. As you interact with her more, though, she'll start to open up. The first support you could have with her is about her backstory. You might have noticed a similarity between her and Lysithia. That is very much intentional. Like Lysithia, Edelgard was tortured at a very young age. She and the rest of her siblings were inducted into dark crest rituals, by a shadowy group known as the Agarthans, or those who slither in the dark. This shadowy group has ties within the Empire, and these experiments killed every single sibling she had. This landed Edelgard with an extra crest, all the pigment in her hair being gone and a reduced lifespan, although not nearly to the extent that Lysithia faces. This understandably shapes her worldview and brings her to the resolve she has today. The next conversation that you have with Edelgard, she will reveal her big goals for the world. Much like other characters in the game, she takes heavy issue with the Crest system. She believes that the Crest system has made a worse version of Folin, where not only are dark experiments conducted in order to artificially give someone a Crest, while not the only group she believes is at fault for this version of Folin, she blames the Church of Saros. She doesn't believe it's right that commoners and non-Crest bearers are forced to do nothing but quote-unquote cling to the goddess, and also having no way to move up in the world because of that. She blames them because the Church of Saros connects Crest to the goddess, perpetuating the lie. Her goal is to make a world where Crests are no longer valued and commoners have the power to stand up on their own two feet. Edelgard is very set on those goals, but with the stuff that Edelgard had to go through, it's at least understandable on why. She will also reveal that she has the same crest Byleth does, which is interesting considering the Crest of Flames is one of the rarest crests in all of Fodlan. So who knows, maybe Byleth and Edelgard are destined for great things? Personality-wise, Edelgard is very level-headed and firm. She is very clearly not afraid to speak her mind and can appear unflinching to those around her. She definitely has a softer side, but she prefers to keep that penned back, and will only really show that side to those closest to her. Edelgard is without a doubt one of my favorite characters, not only in Three Houses, but just about any story I've experienced, and she's not even my favorite in the game. That award would fall to Dimitri. When you first meet him at the beginning of the game, he seems like the epitome of the perfect knight. He is an extremely kind person, and in general very accepting to people he meets. And he is a very noble prince, next in line to be king of Fargus. All of these definitely apply to Dimitri. He is generally trying to do the right thing for his kingdom, but as the game also describes at the beginning, he has a lot of darkness within. 
Like many of the citizens of the kingdom, Dimitri was heavily affected by the tragedy of Dusker. Unlike the other members of the kingdom though, Dimitri was actually there when it happened. He was the sole survivor and had to watch his father, stepmother, and many of his friends be brutally murdered. This left Dimitri with severe PTSD and survivor's guilt. Dimitri decided to take on all of the souls of the lives that were lost, and grew a strong bloodlust for those who caused it. Dimitri even states that the whole reason he's at the Academy is so that he can investigate who caused the tragedy so he can get revenge on them. And that is actually his main motivator throughout most of the game. Dimitri's main character arc is about learning to let go of the past, and not letting events from the past blind you from the present. Dimitri's character goes to a very dark place halfway through the game. Seeing what happens to him is honestly one of the most shocking moments of the game, and his eventual redemption arc, as we'll cover much later in the video, is one of the most poignant things in the entire game. When it comes to his worldview, Dimitri also disagrees with the Crest system, although he has a different idea on the way forward. He believes the Crest system should be abolished, but through gradual change, saying that since Crests are so entangled with the current world, that it would be basically impossible to remove them right away. And side note, as someone that's experienced this game many times, I agree with this line of thinking. I don't necessarily think that his way is the only way forward, just that for Fodlin, I think that would be the better outcome. Although Dimitri and Edelgard are very close in my mind when it comes to my favorite character in the game, I give Dimitri the slight edge just because I think his storyline is just a bit more emotionally resonant. Despite being one of the three main characters of the game, Claude is very different compared to Edelgard and Dimitri. He wasn't tortured or emotionally scarred as a child, his dialogue is a lot more casual, and his main motivator doesn't have anything to do with the Crest system at all. His major goals actually have to do with stuff outside of the country. Despite being the future leader of the Alliance, Claude is actually an immigrant from a neighboring country called Almira. And since the people of Fodlin usually like to look inward, they don't really pay much attention to the other countries. And his appearance within the Alliance has brought a lot of skepticism about his character, even being bullied by some people around him once he joined the Regan family. So his main goal is to create a more open-minded Fodlin that pays more attention to the countries around it, hoping that one day racism towards the other countries like Dusker, Bridget, Dagda, or Almira can stop. Being from an outsider's perspective, Claude is also very skeptical about some of the church's history, and he is very thorough when it comes to investigating it. That definitely falls in line with his personality, because even though he's pretty laid-back while interacting with people, he is also a tactical and inquisitive person as well, often coming up with schemes in order to win battles, and thoroughly investigating things even if they are generally described as being true. Claude is easily one of the most likable characters in the game, and I think that comes from him being pretty chill in general and having some of the most funny lines in the game. He is also very sarcastic and kind. And although Claude is my least favorite of the three lords, he's still a great character that's a perfect offset for the more serious Edelgard and Dimitri. Other than the three main lords, I would say that Rhea is the most important character. She is the leader of the Church of Seros, and is very closely tied to Byleth and Geralt. Rhea is a fantastic character while also being one of the most questionable in terms of morals. And I would really like to deep dive into her character now, but I'm going to save the brunt of that for later, as unlike the other characters where you can get to know them throughout the first half of the game, most of the really interesting things about Rhea are only revealed through events of the story, and a lot of that is very late into the game, so I'm going to save it to later. The last character, I promise, I want to talk about is the main character, Byleth. Now, Byleth is definitely a lot different compared to everyone else. He is a silent protagonist, basically not really having a voice and being a self-insert for you to make your decisions. Byleth is a very stoic character. He doesn't really show his emotions all that much. And although that can definitely just be attributed to him being a silent protagonist, I actually think Byleth is a very solid protagonist. And although he doesn't have too much to offer in terms of personality, the game comments on that and actually gives an in-game reason for why he's like that. The game also doesn't make Byleth the focus of attention. There is mystery when it comes to his background, but he is not the focal point of the narrative. Edelgard, Dimitri, and Claude are. And since the whole point was for him to be a silent protagonist, I think Byleth is very successful at that. And if you're trying to have a protagonist where you can insert your personality into, I'd rather you have a completely silent one rather than one that talks but says nothing. Much like Alir from the game's successor, Fire Emblem Engage. 
So, in conclusion, I think Byleth is a little underrated as a protagonist. He's not my favorite silent protagonist, that would have to be Link or the Persona 5 protagonist, but I think Byleth is a good one regardless. That is finally all of the characters I wanted to talk about. For 15 characters, all it took was nearly 30 minutes to talk about all of them in full. Although that is definitely a large amount of time, I hope it speaks to how well written the characters are in Three Houses. There are several characters I wanted to talk about but I had to leave off due to time. In fact, to the very time I'm recording this, I'm still debating whether or not I should have included certain characters that I didn't. Of course, with a cast this big, not every character is the level of the ones I mentioned here. In fact, there are around five I'd consider pretty bad. But when I say pretty bad, it's only bad compared to the rest of the cast. In any other game, they would be fairly suitable. And I think that really speaks well to how much I love these characters. But now, I think I've finally gotten to a point where I can go on and start talking about the gameplay. Starting off with the gameplay as a professor. The main point about being a professor at Garrick Mach is 1. To train up each of your units so that they are well equipped to handle the battlefield, and 2. To create bonds with your units so that they are closer together and therefore do better in combat. Let's start off with that unit building side of things. Each chapter of Three Houses runs on a calendar system, much like Persona, where you are given the entire length of the month to prepare your units for the upcoming battle that will take place roughly at the end of the month. Unlike Persona, where you make day-to-day -day decisions, Fire Emblem Three Houses roughly runs on a week-by-week -week system where you get to choose on your off day what you want to do with it. Otherwise, every other day will be spent on training your units. For Three Houses, I absolutely believe this was the right call, because although I love Persona's calendar system, I don't think Three Houses would mesh well with it. So Monday of each week, you decide what you want your students to study in. You can set goals for each of your students so that even if you don't give them one-on-one -on -one tutoring, they will still gain experience in the skills you want them to. There are quite a lot of skills on hand here too. There are swords, lances, axes, bows, gauntlets, reason, and faith magic for your weapon types, and then for secondary types, you've got authority, which lets your unit use better battalions as it levels up, heavy armor, riding, and flying skills. There's a lot of freedom that comes with setting goals. While each of your units has advantages and disadvantages when it comes to certain skills, if you want to teach him anything, you can do it. If you want to make Linhart a holy knight instead of his typical bishop class, go ahead. Does one of your units hate flying? Well, make them learn flying anyways. Sure, I would still recommend going somewhat near your unit's quote-unquote canon class or what they're best suited for, but the freedom here is very nice and lends itself really well to multiple playthroughs. The game does lightly push you into making your units go for what they're best suited for, but they never tell you not to, and I think that's really awesome. Once you've trained your units enough in the skills you selected for them, you can have them take certification exams, as long as they're at the required level. If you've taught your students well enough, they will pass their exam and be certified for a new class, making them more powerful than what they were before, allowing them to learn more skills. As you level up, the class exams that your units can take get progressively more and more complex, allowing your units to wield more types of weapons or learn new combat abilities. To be honest, and I suppose it should come as no surprise, but I really like the system. But that comes with one caveat. As I mentioned before, you could have one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions with some of your units each week. This will get them more experience on their skills, more than what they would usually get per week. And the higher you get in your professor level, the more amount of students you can tutor per week. And although on paper that's all fine and dandy, and definitely still a good thing, manually teaching your students gets old about halfway through your first playthrough, as it takes a decent chunk of time and all you're really doing is pressing A on the skill you want them to gain experience in. And since Three Houses is absolutely a game you need to play more than once, manually tutoring someone becomes a chore. Luckily, Three Houses has an option for automatic instruction. Using the auto-instruct would lose out on valuable support points you would get from the unit you're teaching. And using the auto-instruct also takes away from some of the feeling of being a professor. But if I'm being honest, that's probably better than the monotony I would have if I was stubborn and kept manually instructing my students. 
Additional things you can do while teaching is answer student questions. Answering their question will give you a substantial amount of professor points while answering correctly will also boost their morale substantially, which will allow you to teach them more. The last thing you can do is pair off specific units and go on sort of expeditions around the monastery. There are three activities you can choose from here, and each of them will increase a particular stat, whether that be heavy armor, horse riding, or flying. This will also increase the support level between the units you paired up, which will eventually lead to them doing better in combat while placed near each other. On your days off, you get a lot more choices on what you can do. You can choose to rest your units, which will boost the morale. You can have certain units participate in seminars, which will increase the experience on skill points dependent on the teacher you choose. You can bring your units out to the battlefield to make them stronger by doing side missions, or you can do paralogue battles, which are pretty much mini story battles for particular units. The fourth option is the most meaty of these choices, and that is exploring the monastery, which serves as this game's central hub. There is a great deal of things that you can do here. You can simply roam around and interact with the people of the monastery, whether that be the members of your party, or simply just people at the monastery during that specific time. Each person you interact with has a unique set of dialogue for each month. These conversations can be reactions to whatever is going on in the story at that time, they can be conversations that add to the world building of Fodlan, or it could just be a simple conversation. With all the battles that you do throughout Three Houses, it's nice to go and talk to your units and see how they're doing. It also fleshes out Fodlan a lot more. Other than just flat out talking to them, Garrick Mach Monastery offers a lot of ways to grow closer to your units. You can choose two people to join you for a meal. Choosing a meal both of the people that you invited would like will increase your bond with them more. And depending on the week you visit the monastery, there might be a special on a certain type of food. You can also choose two units to join you for choir practice, an option that although you're only able to do once per week, is particularly useful, as not only does it increase the bond between the two units you invited, it also boosts their experience in the faith skill. For one-on-one -on -one activities, you can invite a unit to cook a meal with you. This will help out in combat, as depending on which food you want to cook, it will boost our particular stat for the rest of the month. The upgrades available aren't ridiculously overpowered, but since it applies to the entire party, it's definitely worth doing. You can invite a unit of your choice out to tea. When it comes to increasing supports with Byleth, this is definitely the most efficient option. This is disguised as a nice tea party between two people that are trying to get to know each other better. But what it actually is is an all-important pop quiz, where they're gonna wait for you to give up three conversation topics that they want to hear. And you better give them good ones, because if you don't give them the ones they want, then they're not gonna stay. And if they don't stay, then you don't get all the rewards that comes with having a successful tea time. And, <laughs> there's a follow-up question if you got them all right. And you better guess what they want to talk about, even though some of the topics that are the options you can choose from sound like something the character would actually care about, and then you click on it, and guess what? They don't care about it. And it's all your fault, buddy. I'm mostly just kidding. The dialogue choices you can choose during tea time are fair like 60% of the time, and it's cool that you get to play a little minigame instead of a dialogue box that says you feel closer to someone. But yeah, the dialogue choices are definitely a bit too tricky. But the stat benefits are pretty great. Additionally, there are also some activities that you can use to increase support level that don't take up a time slot, as in answering questions from the advice box, as well as giving gifts, or returning a lost item. All of those activities, as I've mentioned, go into increasing your support level with another unit. So I guess I should go over how the support system in Three Houses really works. When doing any of the activities I just mentioned, the support level between the two units you selected will increase. This will be indicated by an icon with the character's portrait and a heart popping on the screen. And after an unspecified amount of support points are built up, you will be able to view a support conversation, which is like a mini storyline, that is focused on the two characters who are growing closer. Most of the time, these conversations aren't really connected to the main story at all, and are mostly just there to develop the characters more and give them more time to shine. After this, the characters will rank up in their support level, and the two characters are able to do better in combat while placed next to each other. The ranks start out at C, and make their way up to B, and then to A, 
and if you're the main character, eventually S. Within the support system, Three Houses also has a version of romance. This applies not just to the main character, but also everyone else as well. When you get a pair of characters up to rank A, they have the chance to have a paired ending together in the epilogue. Now, this paired ending isn't always a romantic one, as the characters could just go into business together or something like that, or be lifelong friends or whatever. But yeah, for a majority of the characters that can get up to A rank, it is a romantic ending. Romance stuff aside, it is really fun to get all the paired endings and see where your characters can end up. And although I don't really have a problem with the romance stuff, if you're not a fan of it, it's not really heavy-handed at all, and is usually kept pretty vague so that if the characters that got to A rank don't end up having a paired ending, there's an explanation for it. When it comes to the main character, Byleth, it's a little bit more involved, as instead of it coming down to which pair had the most support points, you physically get to make the choice. And depending on the characters you got to A rank with that are available for a romance, you get them as your options. But if you don't want to, you can always just choose no one. And that's pretty much the rundown of the support system. I like it a lot because it's a great way to get to know the rest of your party. I think the obvious comparison is the social links in Persona, but support conversations are on a reduced scale storyline-wise, and they offer conversations between members of your party, whereas Persona, it's only conversations between the main character and someone else. However, there is one big thing about the support conversations in Three Houses I just can't get behind, the sheer quantity of them. With Byleth, it's okay, since he's a main character, so it makes sense that he should be able to talk to every character. However, even though each character can only interact with a set amount, it still goes up to an upwards of 15 people. That means there are probably around 200 pairs of characters that can start a support conversation, and that frankly is just a bit too much. Now, if all of these supports were top-notch storytelling-wise, there'd be no issue. But of course, with that large amount of support conversations, not all of them are really good. Don't get me wrong, there are some great support conversations in Three Houses, but it's just a large percentage of them are pretty average or boring. They don't put the characters in an interesting light or even really do anything interesting at all. God forbid they just talk about cats or fishing the entire time. I definitely think the amount of supports in the game should have been reduced. When the boring stuff takes up about 50% of it, yeah, you could probably afford to take away, like, half the supports, and I don't think it would make that big of a difference. In fact, I think it would actually stand to make the support conversations that are good even better. It would just be quality support after quality support. Now, I'm not gonna go through every support and decide whether or not it's good, because if we did that, we'd be here forever. I still do like this system a lot though, it's heavily integrated into the combat, and when there is a really good support conversation, it sticks in your head for a while. Let's now shift our attention back to the monastery, as there are still some things you can do that I have yet to mention. The monastery has various side quests that you can do. Once you talk to the NPC that gives the quest, you are usually able to complete it right away at the monastery, unless it's a quest relating to a combat trial. Side quests in Three Houses are very basic. They mostly just have you go talk to the right NPC, or pick some item off the ground, or any combination of the two. I don't really fault the game for this, as even though they are simple, they're also done pretty quick. So they're mostly just a good excuse to explore around the monastery. I also think that Three Houses has the perfect amount of side quests. There's not too many as to become overbearing or annoying, but there's also enough where they feel like they actually have a purpose within the game. There is also a greenhouse that you can visit where you can plant seeds. Cultivating the seeds you planted will get you some passive stat increases that you can give to the unit of your choice, as well as some great vegetables that you can use in cooking. Additionally, you can also get food ingredients by doing a little fishing minigame. It mostly just evolves to timing your A presses so you can hit it at the perfect time to get the best fish. However, simple as it may be, it's a lot of fun, and I definitely spent a lot more time than I would have expected playing it. It's just a nice way to get some ingredients for cooking meals. There is also a minigame where you choose a particular unit to compete in a fighting competition, with the reward for winning being a weapon or an accessory. You can spend activity points to increase Byla's skills, as being the professor, he doesn't really get to gain many skill points outside of battle. Lastly, you can visit all of the shops of the monastery and buy equipment. Yes, you can buy the same weapons and items on a menu option, but if you're really interested in getting into the realism factor of the world, you can do so here as well. And that is everything you can do at the monastery. Again, there's another parallel to Persona here. Outside of the tiny stuff, pretty much everything you can decide to do goes on a time slot. 
and once you run out, the only thing you can do is talk to your party members and buy stuff. So, there is a lot of time management at play, and I always like when games do that. It is one of the reasons why Persona is one of my favorite game series, and why Majora's Mask is one of my favorite Zeldas. Although there definitely is similarities between the monastery gameplay of Three Houses and the daily life of Persona, I think Three Houses does a lot of things different. For one, the amount of things you can do per trip to the monastery grows as you go throughout the game. How you grow close to units is also altered in Three Houses, and in general the systems are pretty different. I won't argue that Persona didn't have at least some influence on Three Houses, but I think Three Houses took that inspiration, made it its own, and made it work better for the game it's trying to be. And now we've gone through all the major gameplay systems that you can do outside of combat. So now, I think it's time we move on and start talking about that core combat that the Fire Emblem series is known for. Our victory must be absolute, no matter what it may take. It is time! Three Houses, and by extension its franchise Fire Emblem, is primarily a strategy RPG. How the genre usually works is that you have a set of units that you can control and move around the battlefield on a grid-like system. Each of your units only has a specific amount of tiles that they can move. There will be a group of enemies that you're trying to attack, and your main goal is to take them out tactfully so that you can win the battle with as least damage done to your party as possible. Each battle will have a different objective that they want you to complete, like defeating all of the enemies on the battlefield, taking out an enemy commander, or something more specific. And that is a basic synopsis of the genre. I'm assuming most of you that are going to be watching this already know what the genre is through playing Fire Emblem or some other tactical game like that, but for those who don't, I feel like it's necessary to go over it, as I will be going over the specific things that Three Houses does with it, so now I think we can get into it a little more. Firstly, each of your units has an inventory slot where they can fill it up with weapons, healing items, secondary equipables like staffs or gems, and any other type of item I have neglected to mention. Inventory management is of the utmost importance when it comes to three houses. Weapons run on durability. Every attack you do with them will deplete part of it, so after a while of attacking, that weapon will break, and that will require you to go to the shop and buy a new one or repair it. Your vulneraries that will heal you up if you need it also run on a sort of durability. You only get three charges of them before you're not allowed to use them. So watching your inventory, making sure your weapons are at a good state and you have enough healing items to heal for a tough battle is of the utmost importance and a big part of the tactical gameplay in Three Houses. More than any other game in the genre, Three Houses requires you to pay attention to your inventory. You can spend a lot of time on the unit preparation page before a battle, and I understand if that's not to everyone's taste. Me personally though, I really like how this system works. It lets you think tactfully about your situation before you even start combat. It honestly adds a lot of immersion too. As before any prepared combat, usually there'd be a lot of preparation to ensure things go well. And if you are wasting direct ability points on your better weapons, or using your healing when you don't need to, Three Houses will punish you for it. I'm not really a fan when strategy games will pretty much just let you go blind into every chapter and not really get punished for it, as it kind of takes away from the whole strategy thing when you're basically just allowed to do whatever you want and not really think about it. Sure, having light preparation doesn't necessarily make a game less difficult or even less fun, but it is undeniable that some level of strategy is taken away when you can pretty much just jump in without really thinking about it. So I think Three Houses is approach, and probably my favorite of the genre when it comes to strategy before the main combat begins. Now let's cycle back to something I said earlier about weapons having durability. Three Houses is definitely not the only game in the series to feature weapon durability. In fact, pretty much all the Fire Emblem games do, with the exception of a few. I think Three Houses does weapon durability pretty well. The game makes it so it's something you have to pay attention to, while making most weapons have a pretty high amount of uses before it breaks. The weapons that have the least amount of uses before breaking are often the most powerful ones you'll have, like your hero's relics and stuff like that. Your basic iron weapons will get you around 40 uses before breaking, the upgraded steel versions will get you around 50, and the strongest basic type silver weapons will get you around 25, as silver is much more brittle. I think weapon durability is handled quite well in three houses. 
I don't think weapon durability is the end-all be-all best thing for Fire Emblem though, as the game's successor, Fire Emblem Engage, had really engaging combat without having weapon durability. Of course, as mentioned, each use of a weapon will take up one hit on your durability, but Three Houses also has a different type of attack other than just your normal one. It is called a combat art. As you become more proficient in the weapon type your unit is using, you can use these unlocked combat arts to gain advantages against certain types of enemies or just flat out do more damage. Combat arts are really cool. They give reason to train your unit in a particular skill, and they can help you gain advantages over a certain enemy you normally wouldn't. These combat arts will take more durability though, so you want to be careful about when you use these as they will kill your weapon faster. Let's circle back a little bit and talk about how attacking works. The main combat is surprisingly very luck based. Your weapon of course will do a specific amount of damage depending on who you're using, but the other two stats are dependent. Although the chances of hitting an enemy are usually high, it is possible that your weapon can just flat out miss and you waste your turn. This honestly led to a lot of cool gameplay moments for me. Like early on in my first playthrough when this demonic beast attacked me and it had a 40% chance of hitting me, which would have resulted in death. It ended up missing me, and I ended up winning the chapter with very little health left. It was honestly one of the most memorable moments to me, because literally all of my units were very low on health, and I escaped with just the skin of my teeth. The other luck-based stat is critical hit chance. Most of the time, the chances are very low, so it doesn't happen that often, but if you get lucky, you'll do a critical hit and do three times what you normally would do. With both the stats I just mentioned, they can be influenced based on your character's stat, as well as the enemy you're facing. For example, having a high speed will make you hit your attacks more often, having a high dex Dexterity stat will give you more critical hit chance, and having a high luck stat will reduce the chance of an enemy hitting with a critical hit. Again, a lot of the elements I just went over are things that can be found in other Fire Emblem games, but one of my favorite aspects of the combat in Three Houses is something unique to it. In addition to your basic weapons and abilities, you can also equip a battalion. These are described to you as being mini armies that will work for a particular unit of your choice. In addition to slightly boosting your stats, they also give you a unique ability called a gambit. There are a wide variety of gambits that you can use. A lot of them are offensive ones. You do a sizable amount of damage to an enemy while also doing something else, like freezing them in place, poisoning them, burning the ground around them, or positioning them somewhere else. There are also passive abilities as well, like being able to heal all allies within a range, giving them increased movement for a turn, or allowing a group of allies to act again. Of course, you won't be able to use all the best ones right away, but it is definitely worth it to train everybody in authority to get them to use more battalion, as they are very useful and at times game-breaking. Of course, on your first playthrough, you're not gonna know how to use battalions to their full extent, but with specific combinations of battalions, you can make the game very broken. For example, if you pair up that movement increasing battalion with the ones that allow your units to act again in the same turn, you can pretty much end any encounter that just requires you to kill the enemy commander in one turn. Overall, it might not sound like a good thing, but it added a lot of fun for me on subsequent playthroughs. On them, I would do challenge runs, like trying to beat the game while doing as little turns in combat as possible, which is something I've never really done with any other strategy game I've played. Sure, battalions might be a little bit too powerful. Powerful, but it's still really fun to use, and it's definitely not immediately obvious that you can break the game like this. It takes you pairing up specific battalions in order to learn that, which is just player improvement in my eyes, so I don't really have a problem with it. Crests are also implemented into the combat, as the characters that have them can wield special weapons that other characters cannot, as well as specific boons that can randomly appear when you're fighting people. Characters that don't have a crest aren't necessarily worse than the characters that do, just that characters that do have a crest have advantages that other characters don't. Of course, attacking isn't the only thing you can do while in battle. If one of your units is in a white magic class, they can heal. You can trade inventory with allies. Byleth can actually have a more powerful version of this where he can go into the convoy, which has all the items that you're not currently using. This next one admittedly doesn't happen that much, but occasionally, if you go up to a particular ally, you can engage in conversation with them and occasionally get an item for your trouble. Or lastly, you can simply do nothing and wait if you don't want to waste a healing item and you're not in range to attack anybody. I don't really have anything to add when it comes to my opinion of these other options, but I figured I should mention them anyway if I want to be as in-depth as possible.
possible. Let's move on now and talk about the map design. One of the most important parts about strategy RPGs are the maps you play on. A good map of the genre will have a lot of strategic thinking, either with changes that happen to the map as you play, enemies that are very smartly placed out, lots of different types of terrain, so that you can take advantage of them while your enemies are able to as well. All of this while also having it feel like a part of the world you're playing in is what makes a good map in my opinion. So with all that in mind, how does Three Houses fare? To be honest, I'm a little bit mixed. On the one hand, map design is one of the things that Three Houses is weakest at, but on the other, I can't say it's particularly weak either. A major criticism often given to Three Houses is its reuse of maps. Throughout all your playthroughs, you're going to be playing a lot of the same maps over and over. Not even just side missions where you play maps that happen to be in the main story as well, Sometimes across different playthroughs, you'll be playing the same map again. Sure, the objectives will be different, and you'll often be placed in a different position on the map, but the overall map is pretty much the same. I can 100% understand why people have this problem, and to be honest, I do too. Being someone who's played the game so much, I've definitely gotten sick of a few of the maps. However, I also can't really fault the game here. Three Houses is undoubtedly a game of massive scale, and with that comes a lot of budget restraints, so it makes sense that they'd have to cut some corners in order to make their vision work, as there'd be a lot of new maps you'd have to make in order to limit the amount of times you reuse. So yeah, it's a little annoying, but it's understandable, and hey, the game is still functional. It doesn't make the game unplayable by any stretch of the imagination, it just makes it a little bit annoying. The maps themselves are pretty solid, but nothing too special, at least when it comes to gameplay. Map objectives are very solid, but the different types of terrain are very underused. Sure, certain tiles will get you a stat boost, or something like that, but it's not like it's super important to the main combat anyway. Terrain is something mostly there to help you, rather than something that is required to pay attention to in order to win. There is definitely fun to be had with some of the maps in Three Houses. Across the board, it's pretty good, and there are some standouts. However, if you're going into Three Houses specifically for this, it might not impress you. I would probably suggest Fire Emblem Engage or Triangle Strategy for this instead. The last major thing I want to talk about before moving on is the franchise's most notable gameplay mechanic, Permadeath. In a lot of strategy games, if your unit goes down to zero health in battle, they will just be out for the count for that current battle, and will come back for the next. But in Fire Emblem, if your units die in battle, they are dead, and you're never going to be able to play as them again. Within itself, this adds a lot of strategy without even changing anything about the core combat. This requires you to think smarter before you get into combat, as if you make the wrong decision, that could end up killing one of your favorite characters. Three Houses does have a rewind mechanic where you can go back in time to save a bad decision but you only get a set amount of them per battle. So, if you make too many mistakes, then you won't be able to stop a death of a character if it were to happen. I should mention that you have the ability to turn this feature off before you begin the game, where, like other games, it would just rise again if they were to fall. For a newcomer's first playthrough, I think it's best to have this feature turned off, but for the best story potential, I think it's best to turn it on. As with this feature turned on, the only one that is guaranteed to make it to the end of the game is the main character, and his house leader of choice. Three Houses is probably the Fire Emblem game that benefits the most from having permadeath. Since Three Houses puts a huge emphasis on getting to know your units, it stands to reason that you're probably going to get attached to at least a few of them. You will learn more about their personality and their life aspirations, that if they were to die in combat, it would make it feel so much harder, as you won't even be able to interact with them outside of combat. They will just be gone. Without a doubt, this adds a lot to the story, but since I'm not talking about that yet, I'm going to ignore it for now. But it makes the combat feel more substantial, as there are real consequences for not being prepared enough and letting your units die in battle. And that is just about everything when it comes to combat. Overall, it's definitely not the best of the genre, but it's still really solid. And I think where it shines is how well it's integrated within the other parts of the game. So basically, by itself, it's serviceable, but when you tie it in with the other parts of the gameplay, it's really amazing. Even if overall, it's not perfect. He's gone now, Mother.
When I make videos similar to this one, I don't really cover presentation all that much. If I do talk about a game's presentation, it's usually kept pretty brief. For Three Houses, though, I think this is a pretty important subject. When I say a game's presentation, I mostly mean its graphics, art design, music, and things like that. Let's start off with the graphical side of things. What I'm about to say shouldn't come as too much of a shock for those who have played it, but I want to clarify that when I say this, I'm not talking about the character models or the art design in general. Graphically speaking, Three Houses is pretty weak. I say this as someone who doesn't really care all too much about graphical fidelity, but it's obvious that Three Houses was definitely compromised in order to meet the stylistic vision they wanted. The textures you'll walk by as you're exploring the monastery are pretty undetailed. The actual physical walls of the monastery aren't that bad, but when you start looking at some of the items within the marketplace, or simply the grass you're walking on while exploring the grounds. When it comes to story-related scenes and support conversations, although the character models themselves look really good, there is not a single story scene in the game that takes place place in a 3D environment. Basically, the game has a bunch of flat backgrounds that the characters can be standing in. It is designed so it looks like a 3D area, but in actuality, it's a flat 2D background. Of course, I did not notice this right away on my first couple playthroughs. Some of the backgrounds actually look pretty decent, even good. But then you'd get to a scene where the background was so bad that it was immediately obvious that this wasn't an actual 3D location. I can't even really blame this on the Switch, as we've seen games come out that look much nicer. Both Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild look very pretty, even with their framerate issues. And those are big open-world games. Heck, if you look at the game's successor, Fire Emblem Engage, the backgrounds, while still imperfect, look a heck of a lot better, even if the game's art style might tell you differently. Again, this is probably an issue when it comes to the game's massive vision overwhelming its budget. It's clear that the developers put a lot of work into other aspects of the game, and it makes sense that graphical fidelity isn't one of the top things on their list when they were trying to create three houses. So although I'll say that it's probably unfair to compare it to a PS2 game in terms of how good the graphics are, I can't exactly disagree either. Luckily, even with the rush job when it came to the graphical design, the character models are largely unaffected and still look great. Speaking of, let's talk about this game's art style. This is absolutely an area where Three Houses shines. The animated cutscenes look really good. There are some CGI 3D ones. I'm not sure if these are in-engine. I'd guess not, but I'm not entirely sure. But either way, they look really good. Three Houses also has 2D animated cutscenes, and honestly, these are my favorite ones in the game. I feel the 2D cutscenes do the best job when it comes to portraying the game's art style. Some of the most memorable scenes in the game to me were in these 2D cutscenes. The cutscene you're seeing on screen is definitely one of them, but they get even better as the game goes along, especially in the late game. I don't want to show these cutscenes yet, though, as I don't want to cover story spoilers until they're relevant for this video. Just know that you'll definitely be seeing some of these cutscenes, as a few of them are some of my favorite story moments in the game. The art style as a whole is really good. It's definitely not without its flaws, but there's a lot of stuff to like as well. I feel that Three Houses' character design, although definitely inspired by anime, has a certain amount of regalness to it that really helps connect the characters to the world they inhabit. Each character also has a very distinct design. It is very easy to tell who is who. They are all very memorable, and they actually look like something that character would wear in the world. And that applies not only to the designs that they wear when they're students, but also when they're not. Each character also has a color palette that they have for their outfits, and they really fit each character very well. Trying to think of my favorite character design in this game, but it's really hard because there's just so many to choose from. And you know you've got good character design when it's really hard to pick your favorites. Well, that also applies if your character design is really bad, but luckily for Three Houses, it's not. God, I cannot imagine how much less I would like this game if the character design was on the level of Fire Emblem Engage. Or at least having the same similar designs as Three Houses is a much more serious game, so having ridiculous character design would have been really stupid. So I give mad props to the art team as they did a really good job. 
Let's move on from art direction though and start talking about the UI. I don't really have too much to say on this, but it is solid. It manages to convey a lot of the important stuff that Three Houses has to offer without being too overwhelming. And I think that's really good considering just the large amount of stuff that you're able to do in Three Houses with all its different gameplay mechanics. It's a little bit iffy whether or not this is technically part of presentation, but there wasn't really anywhere else to put it anyway, and it's really important to talk about and that is the voice acting. To put it bluntly, this is probably the best voice cast I've ever seen in the game. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't other games that get close to this, but Three Houses has high quality voice acting throughout all of its run. And when I say all its run, I truly mean all of it. The entire game is fully voiced. From scenes from the main story, to support conversations, to the monastery, Every single line of dialogue that a character gives is fully voice acted. This is a very impressive feat for a game of its scale. With the different paths that you can go down in three houses, there is a lot of dialogue that you only hear on one route. So it was undoubtedly a lot of work to get all of that recorded, and to have the voice actors absolutely kill it with each of their characters. Even the characters I don't like, I can't say that their voice acting was bad, because it wasn't. Similar to the character design, it's really hard to pick an individual performance that I like the most. Depending on the day, I can probably cycle between five people that I choose to be my favorite performance. Tara Platt as Edelgard, Chris Hackney as Dimitri, Jeremy Lee as Rhea, Joe Zija as Claude, Billy Kamitz as Ferdinand, David Lodge as Geralt and the narrator, and many, many many more great performances that I honestly feel bad for not name dropping. It's that good all across the board. Speaking of that, let's move on to the final thing I want to talk about before moving on to the story. I'm going to keep this pretty quick as you've already been hearing the soundtrack a lot throughout this video, but other than the voice acting, I think the music is the most consistently amazing part about Three Houses. Taking place in a medieval setting, of course you got your great orchestral songs here. The battle themes do a great job of pumping you up during combat, and he even has the great thing to have two different versions depending on what stage of combat you're in. Sometimes even the non-combat songs are just as catchy and well put together, if not more so sometimes. Times. What I really love about the soundtrack is that it's not afraid to switch genres. Although yes, it's mostly in the orchestral genre to fit the medieval time period, but it isn't afraid to throw a dubstep song at you, or whatever genre God Shattering Star is from. If you've played the game, you know what I'm talking about. The soundtrack also has a light motif called the Edge of Dawn that you will hear a lot throughout the game. It's a very great tune because not only is it super recognizable and a very good tune by itself, but it also connects to the story so well that whenever you think of Three Houses, you will probably think of this song first. So to conclude, the soundtrack of Three Houses is really amazing. The great songs are some of the best I've ever seen in a video game, and even the more basic ones, I'm using basic in quote marks, end up being stuck in your head even if you didn't expect it. And that is everything I can cover when it comes to this game's presentation. It is definitely rocky in parts, but the rest is good enough to kind of alleviate that. And now the time has finally come to continue the story discussion where I left about an hour and two minutes ago. All the way back in the introduction when I said choosing your house will be the most important decision you make in the game, I meant it. The house you choose will decide how the story goes and what ending you get. And if you chose the Black Eagles, there is even an additional split later on in the route. Each of these paths will give you different perspectives on Fodlin, so all of this means for me that it's going to be really hard to break this all down. Three Houses' narrative is split into parts. Part 1 encompasses your time as a professor. It is entitled White Clouds, and no matter which house you chose, it will play out mostly the same. Not to say it's identical across all of the paths, there is some unique story beats for each of the houses. I'll be covering all the unique stuff that happens later on in this section, but you should know, since it is pretty much the the same roadmap for all the routes, I will be showing Black Eagle, Blue Lions, and Golden Deer route interchangeably. So if you notice scenes have a different border, either red, blue, or yellow, just know that that scene most likely takes place on the other routes as well, unless I mention otherwise. And now I think we can start. 
After you've chosen the house that you want, you do a quick mock battle against the other houses, which allows you to get to know your units better, and to prove yourself as a professor. After you prevail, Rhea is of course impressed with you, and the game progresses to the next chapter. How story missions are dealt with in part 1 is that the church will give you and your students objectives to do at the end of the month. The first mission they send you on is to go subdue some bandits that have been rummaging around the Red Canyon, an area very sacred to the church. They are revealed to actually be the same group of bandits you fought in the prologue in your very first battle. These same group of bandits are also revealed to be working for a shadowy figure that will become to be known as the Flame Emperor. The Flame Emperor is not impressed with the bandits for trying to take on the Knights of Saros and is prepared to let them die for it. And that is what ends up happening to them. You, the students, and the Knights of Seraphs go in, and the bandits go down very easily. The Red Canyon is a very mysterious place, especially to the mysterious girl in your head, Sothis, who will have a mysterious connection to the place without knowing why. And if you chose the Black Eagles, Edelgard will question it as well, wondering who lived there before it was abandoned. In the next chapter, you are tasked with stopping a rebellion in Kingdom territory against the church. The head of this rebellion is Lord Lenato, who is the guardian of Ash of the Blue Lion House. You team up with one of Rhea's best knights, Catherine, and working together, you manage to quell the rebellion. It is no happy matter though, as you are forced to not only kill Lenato, but also the commoner militia that joined his cause. Everyone is naturally shaken up about this, especially the Blue Lion's Path, where Ash and Dimitri have have a connection to Lenato, and it's happening in their territory. Unfortunately, stopping the uprising only reveals a new problem. On Lenato's body, there was a letter going over a plot to assassinate Rhea. After this, Rhea and Catherine thank you for a job well done, and also giving a mysterious line about needing to punish any sinner who betrays the goddess when hearing that the students were shaken up about fighting militia. Following finding the assassination letter, your mission for the next chapter is obviously to patrol the monastery and protect Lady Rhea, while also finding out the true cause of the note as it's obviously been planted. The plot is known to occur on the Rite of Rebirth, which is a very important ritual for the church, so you and your house will spend the month investigating the monastery, looking for locations that might be the true aim of the group who sent the note. Through thorough investigation, you come to realize that the enemy is most likely planning to attack an area of the monastery called the Holy Mausoleum, an area said to hold the tomb of Saros, the girl you saw in the opening to the game. Your house is, of course, right on the money, and you discover a mysterious group trying to rob the tomb of Saros. What they find is not her body, but rather a sword. Your house manages to repel them off, and the sword awakens when Byleth touches it. This weapon is revealed to be the Sword of the Creator. It is an immensely powerful weapon that Nemesis used to use, Nemesis being the man that Saros stabbed at the beginning of the game, and the weapon bears the Crest of Flames, which is said to be the same one the Goddess has. Up to this point, the game had not revealed what crest Byleth has, which puts an end to one mystery while creating a new one. How does Byleth, a commoner, have the same crest as the all-powerful goddess and one of the most dangerous men in Fodland's history? A subdivision of the Church of Saros called the Western Church are revealed to be the perpetrators on the attack of the Holy Mausoleum unsurprisingly also being linked to the Flame Emperor. The game doesn't reveal the person the Flame Emperor is talking to here, but the man's name is Talus, and he is the leader of a shadowy group called Those Who Slither in the Dark, also known as the Agarthans. Before the next chapter begins, there is a hearing on the priests that attack the Holy Mausoleum, and they are pretty quickly sentenced to death. For invoking a sacred rite. In my opinion, these priests were definitely guilty of wrongdoing, but the scene is mostly there to show what happens when you go against the church's teachings. The Church of Saros never forces anyone to be religious, but they are also very unflinching when it comes to punishing wrongdoers. Then, no matter what house you chose, they will all question why the church is doing that, as it seems pretty harsh. In the next chapter, you and your house go back to Kingdom territory, this time to stop a group of bandits who have stolen a hero's relic. The leader of this group of bandits is actually Sylvain's brother, who stole their family's hero's relic after being shunned out of the family for not having a crest. You fight your way through his bandits and come face to face with him, who, after using a hero's relic without a crest enough, transforms into a monster. The game clearly states that you should not use a hero's relic if you don't have the right crest, and Sylvain's brother Miklon becomes the example about what happens. The monster he transforms into is called a demonic beast, and what it is is clearly stated within the name. He is no longer Miklon anymore, he is just a monster.
Once Byleth and the gang return to the monastery, they discover that Sedatha's young sister Flane has gone missing, and that it is their goal to find her as soon as possible. Similar to the Holy Mausoleum sequence from a couple chapters back, this has you and your house investigating around the monastery to find out what happened. You find out that two other teachers have gone missing, Yuritsa and Manuela, and once you investigated all the pieces you need to, you can go into Yuritsa's house to find Manuela, unconscious, as well as a pathway to an underground area. You find Flane and another character down here you haven't met yet. You don't find Yuritsa down here, but you come across the Death Knight, who is definitely not the same person as Yuritsa, and with that, it ties the Flame Emperor and Talus into this, as the Death Knight is one of their most powerful soldiers. And after fending the enemy off and rescuing Flane, Sadith is eternally grateful and begins to trust you more, allowing Flane to even join as a member of your house, and unknowingly saving another student named Monica who went missing a year ago, ending the chapter on a very happy note. The chapter after you get Flane is actually a pretty quiet one. This is a chapter where you and the other houses go to Grandeur Field in the Empire for a mock battle. This might be the second mock battle between the houses, but this one is on a much bigger scale compared to the first one. This is a commemorative mock battle based off the Battle of the Eagle and Lion, as Empire and Kingdom forces fought there long ago. Byleth and his house, of course, end up winning this mock battle, and after the Battle of the Eagle and Lion, they all have a feast in the dining Hall together. And hey, maybe that means with the three future leaders getting along, that peace is possible between the three nations. That month of quiet is short-lived, however, as the next month you are sent to investigate the town you started the game in, as mysterious happenings have been taking place there. It didn't seem too serious until Geralt comes up to Byleth at the end of the month and tells him that the situation has turned devastating. Once you reach Ramire, you see the village is in chaos. A lot of the population have turned psychotic. The village is in flames. All while the mysterious group, those who slither in the dark, watch on. It turns out that an underling mage of Talus named Solon has been doing dangerous experiments on the village. Solon is also a shapeshifter who pretended to be the librarian to Moss throughout the entire game. Then, that leads you into a mission where your goal is to save as many of the villagers as possible while defeating the mages as well. It's possible to save all of the villagers, and it's also possible for them all to die. The game lets you continue on even if a large percentage of the villagers die, but it is still made very clear that you should not ignore them. After forcing the mages to retreat, you assume that it was once again the Flame Emperor and Talus who caused the attack. But before you're able to go back to the monastery, the Flame Emperor actually appears in front of you to have a conversation. In that conversation, the Flame Emperor actually claims that they are appalled at what happened here and they had no knowledge of it. They promise they plan to get revenge on the people that caused it, even though the people that actually caused it are people they are temporarily working with in order for a greater goal. The Flame Emperor then asks Byleth and Geralt if they want to work with them, because they state that if they had the Sword of the Creator with Byleth, they would need the people who commit the atrocity in Remire. You are then given a dialogue option where you can say you will work with them or not. Sadly, this choice doesn't mean anything, as even if you say you will work with them, they will assume you're lying, because they can sense the anger in your eyes. On my first playthrough, I actually selected yes when they asked me if I wanted to work with them, and I think it would've been kind of cool if there was a way to explore this option, but that's all hypothetical, because I'm not sure how that would even work. And yeah, it most definitely wouldn't, but hey, a man can dream. After this, the Flame Emperor will regret that you could not see things their way, and they will disappear. What I really like about this scene is that it doesn't make it clear whether or not the Flame Emperor is telling the truth. In a couple chapters it will, but I really I really like that it doesn't make it obvious here, as you definitely should not be sympathizing with the Flame Emperor. Yet. This chapter of the game ends on the conversation with your house leader about the events that just happened. With the Black Eagle route, Edelgard will wonder whether or not the Flame Emperor is telling the truth, Dimitri will not believe the Flame Emperor whatsoever and will just assume that they're behind everything, while Claude will just question more about what the Flame Emperor really wants. Before I move on and talk about the rest of part 1, I want to pause here and talk a little bit more about the early game chapters. The early chapters I just went over are mainly there to accomplish certain things for the story. Those goals are 1. To introduce and create mystery surrounding the Flame Emperor and Talus, making you wonder who they are and what they want. I think this is done quite well in the early game, as this is not actually how Talus and the Flame Emperor look. The Flame Emperor 1 is obvious since it's a disguise, but with Talus it's much better hidden. As 
revealed in the Remire Village chapter, those who slither in the dark are fully capable of shapeshifting. So the man you're seeing on screen is just someone that Talus is pretending to be. And although they are working together, it's not clear whether or not it's for the same goal, which creates a lot of good mystery. Two, to also create a lot of mystery about Rhea's intentions. She's hired someone that's old enough to be a student to teach an entire class at a prestigious monastery. Not only that, but she clearly has a lot of history with Byleth's father, and probably knows more about Byleth than he even does. This also ties into Sothis, as what the heck is she doing inside your head? And three, not only is there doubt with Rhea, but also doubt with the entire Church of Seraph, as they are very, very hard on the people that betray the teachings of the the church, not only send a bunch of teenagers to do important night work, like quelling a rebellion and killing bandits, but also fight literal monsters, and Rhea and the church say very vague things when the students aren't happy with it. Professor, those in power, no matter the era, always claim they fight for a just cause, that they take life to protect it. But is it truly okay to take any life you please? All in service of some implacable just cause? Now, this is just over halfway into White Clouds, but I absolutely love that this early in the game there's so many mysteries with so many different factions, it's incredible. Let's get back to it though. The next chapter is probably one of the most memorable for many who played this game. The Church of Seros are planning a ball for the students, and for much of the month it's a very happy time. You choose one of your students to take place in a dancing competition. Your students eagerly wait the ball. Your house leader will suggest that they all meet again five years after they graduate. Pretty much like a high school reunion, but this time for the Millennium Festival, which will be the monastery's 1000 year anniversary. Everyone has a fun on time at the ball, and Byleth even has a totally platonic conversation with his favorite student. And that favorite student is whoever you want. A few days after the ball, though, your house and Gerald are sent to fight some monsters that are attacking a chapel. These are revealed to be students that were turned into demonic beasts, like Miklon. Monica, the student you saved alongside Flane, is mysteriously there and when Gerald isn't looking, she stabs him in the back. I didn't really talk about her character much after Flane's reappearance, because she wasn't really around much. She pretty much just stood to the side the entire time, not talking to you, and it was pretty obvious that she had something else going on. So, although her betrayal isn't the most mind-blowing thing ever, I still think it's well done, as it ends up causing the death of Byleth's father, Gerald, even after he rewinds time to try to save him, because Talus mind jumps out of nowhere and blocks your attack on Monica. Monica and Talus escape, leaving Byleth to grieve over his father, and the previously emotionless Byleth cries for the first time in his life. Gerald's demise might not be the most impactful character death in Three Houses, especially if you've played a lot of the Fire Emblems, but it's still a really solid one. Where it succeeds is the suddenness of it. Back when I played the game for the first time, I expected Gerald to die right away, so when he took a while, I wasn't expecting it when it finally did. It also works really well because it sets up a great revenge mission. Before this point in the game, those who slither in the dark were just another evil group you had to defeat at some point. They never really affected Byleth personally, and just did bad stuff to the world. But after they killed Gerald, Byleth is going to want them gone. Before the revenge chapter can begin, there is a conversation between Talus, the Flame Emperor, and the fake Monica. This doesn't really reveal much about their plans, but it does reveal that the Flame Emperor truly does not like what those who slither in the dark are doing. So that means whoever the Flame Emperor is, is not one of them. The grieving chapter is stuck between two of the biggest chapters in part one, but it's basically just as important. Most of the month is relegated to Byleth getting over his grief for his father's death. Although I'll defend Byleth much more than the average person, I don't really think this works all too well. The scene from the previous chapter where Byleth cries for the first time upon seeing his father die, I think that works pretty well. But having an entire month where he's supposed to be sad just doesn't work as well. He is a silent protagonist, and for the most part, he is stoic. He doesn't have a voice, so it's kind of hard to be sad for Byleth when he doesn't even talk. Byleth is absolutely a self-insert protagonist, so watching Byleth greed the entire chapter just doesn't hit. However, there is a good scene related to Byleth's grief, and that is when he's talking to the house leaders at the beginning of the month. Your house leader of choice will give Byleth words of advice to how to deal with the grief. Each one of them will say something different. The advice they give really opens up to how they view grief in general. And in my opinion, it even expands their character a little bit more. And on repeat playthroughs, this scene is great too, because the advice the house leaders give help contrast them from each other. 
There is also a pretty major story reveal at the beginning of the chapter. After you're rummaging through Gerald's office after his death, you find his diary that goes over Rhea and Gerald's history and what caused Gerald to leave the Knights of Saros. In the diary, Gerald talks about how Byleth's mother died in childbirth. It also shows how he began to fear Rhea, as Rhea helped Byleth survive because he was essentially stillborn after his birth. He didn't cry like a normal baby could, and although he had a normal pulse and was breathing, he had no heartbeat. And Gerald, believing that Rhea was responsible somehow, decides to flee from the Knights of Saros by creating a distraction. Obviously, since we're still in the first half of the game, it doesn't go into whether or not Rhea actually did something, and if she did, what exactly. I still really like this diary scene, though, as it offers a lot of great backstory for the plot, while also making the situation with Rhea even more confusing. At the end of the month, you and your house finally discover where those who slither in the dark are hiding starting your revenge mission. They are located in the sealed forest right outside the monastery. Rhea begs you not to go fight them, but your house leader steps in and convinces them to let you go. So, you rush in and go to kill the fake Monica. You succeed in your plan, but it was all a trap. Solon, the mage from the Ramire village chapter, traps you in an eternal void after you kill the fake Monica. Sothis is of course mad at you for falling for his trap, but at this point she finally remembers that she is the goddess that Rhea is talking about. Oh yeah, by the way, there is a point a couple chapters ago where Rhea will call the goddess Sothis, leaving the two of you confused because you have never heard the name of the goddess before, but I couldn't find a proper place to put it in, so I'm just bringing it up now. Anyways, Sothis, finally remembering who she really is, decides to sacrifice herself in a way so that Byleth can escape the void. She decides to merge her consciousness with Byleth so that he has the powers of the goddess and therefore can escape the void. Doing this also means she won't be able to interact with Byleth anymore, which technically is only mostly true. There is only one guaranteed scene that she appears in the main story after this, and it doesn't reveal her name, even though it's obviously her talking. Either way, Sothis was a good character and a pretty good voice for Byleth because he definitely does not have one. The merging scene itself is visually really cool, even if it's a little bit too anime for my taste. And with this new power, you kill Solon, leaving only one major mage of those who slither in the dark remaining. Well, at least of the mages that have a major part in the story. After the battle, Byleth collapses and wakes up to find Rhea. And let's just say she's a little happy for Byleth merging with the powers of a goddess. Just a little bit happy though, nothing too crazy. With this newfound power, she invites Byleth to go to a holy tomb at the end of the next month to conduct an ancient ritual meant for those with the powers of a goddess. She is quite clearly very happy about this, and she even tells you you can bring your allies to the ritual, because having your closest allies, in this case his students there, is a very important part of it. This next chapter is undoubtedly the turning point of the game, so I'm going to take another pause here. I'm pausing here because I want to talk about the different stuff that happens when you choose different houses. Like I said before, most of the stuff I just went through happens on every single route no matter what house you choose, but there's also some smaller plot lines that occur based on the house of your choice. On the Black Eagles route, you learn a lot more about the horrors that the Crest system can bring. This information he learns is via Edelgard. As the two characters go closer, she tells him more about what she had to go through when she was a child. Cruel and horrible experiments that those who slither in the dark did in order to give her a second crest. There are some smallish scenes sprinkled throughout part one where Edelgard and her vassal Hubert talk about her destiny. There are about two scenes where this happens, and most of it you can assume is based off the conversation she has with Byleth, where she goes over her ideal version of Fodlin. The Black Eagle side of things also brings a lot more attention to the weird stuff the Church of Saros is doing. It is definitely not the only house that brings attention to it, but it is by far the one that emphasizes it the most. There is also a pretty obvious difference for those of you that have played this game, but it happens in the Holy Tomb chapter, and I don't want to talk about it till we get to it. Moving on to the Blue Lion side of things, it definitely has the most amount of unique content. Instead of focusing on the church, it focuses a lot more on the tragedy of Dusker, mostly about what happened and how it's currently affecting Dimitri. Unsurprisingly, it's still affecting Dimitri's life in a major way. He still acts like a gallant prince, but you can occasionally see that fade away and he stumbles into his darkness. The tragedy of Dusker is the exact reason that Dimitri is even at the monastery, something that he clearly states. I came here for revenge. And one day, I will have it. There are even some points within the main story where you can see that Dimitri's shield is crumbling, and he is on the verge of losing it. He always manages to regain himself though, so he should be fine. 
right? The Blue Lions version of White Clouds also gives a really good reason why the Church and Flame Emperor situation isn't really focused on, and that's because he assumes that the Flame Emperor is evil and he wants to eliminate him. The Blue Lion's path isn't all doom and gloom though, as it also gives a lot of backstory for Dimitri and even Edelgard. This path reveals that Edelgard and Dimitri are actually step-siblings. Edelgard's mother is Dimitri's stepmother. Dimitri and Edelgard were very close for the year they interacted as kids. They were good friends, and Dimitri even says that Edelgard taught him how to dance when he was young. The reason they were able to interact was because Edelgard was stationed in the kingdom for a year, so she can be better protected. Eventually, Edelgard had to return back to the Empire, but before she left, Dimitri gave her a dagger, as a parting gift. On a completely unrelated note, a conversation with Sylvain and Dimitri will reveal that Dimitri gave a dagger to the first girl he liked. So... The Golden Deer Path probably has the least amount of new information to make it stand out from the other two versions, but it does have a pretty heavy emphasis on the history of Fodlan. As mentioned in the character section, Claude is an outsider for Fodlan, so he wants to know all he can about its history. In these unique scenes, Solon, who is pretending to be the librarian Tomastil, will plant seeds of doubt in Claude's mind about the church potentially covering up its history and it's even exasperated by the fact that Sedith confiscates a book that Claude has going over a dragon called the Immaculate One. And that is pretty much it for unique storylines that happen in the different versions of White Clouds. I didn't mention that, of course, you have different students for each path, so they react to events differently, but that wasn't really worth bringing up, as it's pretty obvious. Each of the storylines I just went over are more than just flavor, because they absolutely are important in part two of their respective routes. But of course, we'll cover it more when we get to it. And now let's finish up White Clouds. The Holy Tomb chapter honestly doesn't have much going on up until the final chapter where it all comes together. But if your house of choice was the Black Eagles, you get an option to go with Edelgard to the Imperial Capital. You only get this option if you got a support level up to C+, but if you do, let's just assume that Byleth says yes and goes with her, because choosing to go with Edelgard to Enbar will open up a new decision that you wouldn't normally get. What Edelgard is doing in Enbar is taking over her dying father's place as the Emperor of of Adrestia. Now, to do this normally, she would require the Archbishop of the Church of Saros to be there, but since Rhea basically crowned Byleth as being a member of the family of the goddess, Byleth technically counts, so she can be made Emperor without much hassle. It's a very impactful scene for Edelgard as a character, especially because you can only get the scene after seeing what Edelgard has gone through. So seeing her be crowned Emperor, finally being able to start chasing her ideal world is a very powerful moment in the story. And like I said, on the other paths, you don't get to see this. No matter what, she will be in Embar for this chapter, but this is the only way you get to see it in person. At the end of the month, you and your house go down to a holy tomb, a location that basically no one around the area even knows about. Rhea instructs Byleth to sit on the throne of the goddess, which, funnily enough, Sothis actually sits on when she's inside your head. He goes to sit in the throne, but nothing happens, much to Rhea's dismay. She never really tells you at this point in the game what she wants the ritual to do, but it clearly isn't working. But before the ritual can go any further, you are interrupted by the Adrestian Empire and the Flame Emperor. If you chose the Black Eagle route, you actually find out who the Flame Emperor is much quicker. Otherwise, the Flame Emperor still has a mask. But no matter what, you will eventually find out that the Flame Emperor is Edelgard. Now that she is the Emperor, she is ordering the Imperial army to raid the caskets of the tombs in the area, as each one of them holds a crest stone. This is honestly one of the biggest reveals in the entire game. No matter which route you choose, you always get some sort of hint that Edelgard is the Flame Emperor. In the Black Eagle route, it's obvious that she wants to change the world, and she talks about big plans with Hubert. In the Blue Lion's Path, she'll throw a dagger at Dimitri after hearing someone in the woods, which is something that Dimitri realizes is the same dagger that he gave her as a child, but he quickly ignores it because he doesn't want it to be true. And in the Golden Deer Path, she'll tell Claude that she has big plans she can't reveal to him, but she hopes he'll back her when the time arrives. That isn't even all the hints that the game gives you, but it's very important to mention that they hint it no matter if you chose Edelgard as your house leader or not. So although this isn't the most mind-blowing twist of all time, it is really well done, because it makes sure that you can guess it no matter which house you choose. And it completely recontextualizes the concept of the Flame Emperor, because now he's not just some random guy. She, rather, is someone you've interacted with on a daily basis if you chose the Black Eagles, or someone who looks like they have good intentions on the other two routes. 
Hildegard will tell you that she doesn't want to fight you, but if you attempt to get in her way, she's not afraid to attack you. And Rhea will tell you to stop Edelgard from stealing the Crust Stones, and since she's still your boss, you don't really have much option. You will end up being able to stop her from stealing the Crust Stones, which will lead to Edelgard declaring war on the Church of Seros, saying that they've taken advantage of a Crest system in order to rule the world. She wants to destroy the Church of Seros so that Folin can be unified and anyone can rise up to their situation. It is also made clear that she's not declaring war on people who believe in the goddess, but rather those who take advantage of their beliefs for their own gain. And of course, the first area she's going to attack is Garakamaka Monastery. But before we cover that, we have to cycle back as there are some unique things I want to bring up from the Holy Tomb section. First off, if you chose the Golden Deer or Blue Lions, you are forced into fighting the Empire without any choice. This makes sense because you don't have a personal connection to Edelgard and you have no reason to. But specifically on the Blue Lion section, it's a very important character moment for Dimitri because this is a moment where he finally snaps. With all the trauma he has gone through, he has spent the last couple years looking for the person he believes caused the tragedy of Dusker, and finding out that the Flame Emperor, someone he believes is behind it, is actually Edelgard, his stepson sister, and maybe something more, causes him to go to a very, very dark place. Now, on this path, it's not entirely clear whether or not Edelgard was actually involved, although it's very heavily implied that she wasn't, because why the heck would a nine-year-old girl instruct a bunch of people to cause a massacre killing her mother and, and very important kingdom nobles for basically no reason? But to Dimitri, that doesn't matter. He's found someone he believes caused it, and he is not going to stop until he kills her. This is one of the best cutscenes in the game, as it shows his descent in the madness, as it shows Byleth desperately trying to get Dimitri to think straight, but he can't, and he won't. It is such an amazing scene, and one of the most surprising things that happened right after another big reveal. The Black Eagles version of this event is much more of a choice. As long as you went with Edelgard to Embar, you are given a choice. Do you want to side with Edelgard? Or do you want to stick with Rhea? Like I said at the beginning of this choice, this is the crucial choice that decides your ending on the Black Eagles part. The game splits in two after this decision. If you side with Rhea, obviously you're going to be fighting Edelgard in combat. So the next chapter will play out similar to the Golden Deer and Blue Lions version. However, you can definitely choose to go against Rhea if you want. And this will be the only route in the game where you fight the church instead of the Empire. Choosing Rhea will make Edelgard understand your position, but wish you could have seen things her way, but choosing Edelgard instead will make Rhea just a little bit mad. I will not allow one who would lend our enemies strength to wield the power of the goddess Sothis. I have passed judgment, and now I shall rip your chest open and take back your heart myself! With White Clouds coming to an end, the last chapter is of course split in two. Let's start off with the option of you siding with the church first, because that's obviously the one most people are going to get on the first playthrough. The tone is that of uncertainty. The entire monastery just got thrown into a war they were not prepared for. With Edelgard and Hubert gone, everyone is trying to figure out what they're going to do. Nobody knows for sure yet, but they have to fight them anyway and figure out later. In this version of events, Rhea will appoint Byleth to be the next Archbishop of the Church of Seros, were she to fall in battle. Because remember, she has a very strong attachment to Byleth now. Eventually, after a couple weeks, the Empire shows up, and the big battle begins. You manage to repel the Imperial Army for a while, but at a certain point, Edelgard decides to retreat and summons in those who slither in the dark to finish up things. At this point, Rhea will reveal that she can turn into a dragon, which she does, in order to stop some of the demonic beasts that those who slither in the dark have sent upon them. They do their best, and Rhea even manages to kill most of the beasts, but right when they're not expecting, Tallis of those who slither in the dark appears and uses his magic on Byleth to push him into a canyon. Byleth cannot do anything to stop it, and then he blacks out after falling into the canyon. On the siding with Edelgard route, you and the Black Eagles join up with her at an Imperial camp, where you prepare to fight the Church of Seros. She makes everyone an important general and calls their group the Black Eagle Strike Force. Flane, of course, does not join your team here because she is related to Sedith and she's close with Rhea as well. Edelgard expresses her gratitude for Byleth and her Black Eagle friends for deciding to go with her because she honestly didn't expect them to. The tone in this version is also very different as well. It's tense for sure, but it also is very rebellious, because you're fighting with Edelgard to create a better future while also having to fight basically everyone you were friends with before you joined her. You still have to work with those who slither in the dark, and it won't be till part 2 of this path until they fully explain why. 
In this version, the Empire still win the Siege of Garrick Mach, and Byleth is still thrown away into a crater, but this time it's done by Rhea, not Talus. And with that, Part 1 of Three Houses also comes to a close. From this point, this story will split into four, depending on which house you chose, and if you chose Black Eagles, whether or not you decide to side with Edelgard or Rhea. The story of White Clouds is really, really good, with one major flaw. The story is really interesting, but the major flaw is that you have to play through White Clouds four times with very minimal differences in order to get all the endings, or just over three if you're smart and save before the Edelgard decision. But that's still a lot of times you're going to be playing the same half of the game with very minimal changes. Pretty much all of the stuff I mentioned is basically the only differences that happened on different playthroughs of White Clouds. And although that made White Clouds a little bit easier for me to go through, I think it could have done with a couple unique chapters for the different houses, because as it stands, it pretty much goes the exact same way every time. I don't even think it needs that many more unique chapters, just a few to make it a bit more interesting. Your house is of course not the only one that goes on missions. The other two houses go as well to their own separate missions, but they don't really tell you what they do. Because there is one, maybe even two chapters that you could probably make an alternate for, based more on the region of the house you chose. Because the chapter where you fight Lord Lanato and the chapter where you fight Sylvain's brother Miklon are much more important to the members of the kingdom than they are to the Empire or Alliance. Yes, these chapters are here because they introduce very important concepts for the story going forward, like the distrust of the church that some people have, as well as the dangers of using a hero's relic without a crest, while introducing the concept of a demonic beast. I don't know what these unique missions could have been, but there's definitely potential to explore the same concepts but tie them more to the region you chose. Because as it stands, although White Clouds is perfect for the Blue Lions, it's a little weak when talking about the Black Eagles or the Golden Deer. And these new chapters could have potentially alleviate the problems that come with having the same route over again. And obviously, the Empire gets their fair share of development, but the Alliance doesn't really get as much in the main story, so it could have helped them especially. Luckily, there's a lot more positives to go over. I really like the central mysteries that White Clouds introduces. All of the central mysteries were very interesting to me, and I really liked that some of them were saved to be solved in Part 2, especially the whole Flame Emperor situation. The tone set up in Part 1, while definitely having its dark moments, is mostly mystifying and having a much more light-hearted tone than the rest of the game. And as soon as Edelgard declares war, the story shifts in tone, as everyone prepares to go to war, and becomes very serious for the rest of the game. This next thing I really like is kind of dipping into Part Part 2, but I want to bring it up here because it happens no matter what. After Byleth blacks out in the canyon, he wakes up to find that five and a half years have passed and the war rages on. Now, when I told all of you back in the introduction that I played this game completely blind, I mean it. I did not know that there was a time skip at all, and it was one of the most shocking things that happened. I know I said that a lot, but that should really speak to how good this game's story is 95% of the time. I now know that the time skip was a pretty big part of marketing leading up to Three Houses' release. I did not play this game at release, and that way, I had no idea what it was in store for. The time skip hits so much harder if you don't know it's coming. Five and a half years is a long time, and that could change so much, and you want to know what's going on. What has happened in the war? Where are your students? These kind of questions go through your head if you have not guessed at a time skip is happening. It's kind of weird to think about in my real life because what if I just one day blacked out for a year? What would happen, and where would I be? That is why Three Houses, in my opinion, is best played completely blind. Obviously, since it was a big part of marketing, I can't really get mad at people who didn't, and who knows, maybe the time skip will hit hard either way. Either way, Byleth will be waken up by an unnamed villager, will tell him that five years have passed, talking about how the Millennium Festival was cancelled due to the war, causing Byleth to remember the promise he made to his students to meet five years after they graduated, causing him to run off in the direction of the monastery. Now that we're in part two, there are obviously four different versions of what Byleth finds there, so I will split these sections up. I will start off talking about the Church Route and the Golden Deer Route, entitled Silver Snow and Verdant Wind respectively, then the next section will be the Blue Lines version of Part 2, entitled Azure Moon, and then the final one will be Edelgard's Route against the Church of Seros, as that's the most unique one, so I'm saving it for last. So now, let's finally get into Part 2. Even though our swords may cross as they do now. <laughs> <laughs> There's no denying that our chosen paths never will. 
Those of you that have played Three Houses probably understand why I grouped Silver Snow and Verdant Wind into one section, instead of giving each of them their own. But I understand some of you watching probably haven't played this game before, so what I'll do is I'll go and cover everything from Silver Snow, the Church Route, and after that, we'll move on to Verdant Wind. Silver Snow, of course, opens up with Byleth waking up in the riverbed, being woken up by a villager. The villager does the usual thing and reveals to Byleth that five years have passed since Byleth was last awake, and remembering his promise to the Black East, Eagles, Byleth decides to return to the monastery to meet up with them. A happy reunion is not what Byleth finds, though. He meets Edelgard in the Goddess Tower, and she tries to convince him one last time to join her side. Byleth, of course, refuses, though, as he is loyal to the Church and Rhea, and to him, he basically made this decision three weeks ago. She and Byleth get into a little sword fight, but she stops it, telling him that the next time they meet, one of them will die. And she very regretfully leaves back for Embar. This opening scene with Edelgard does a really good job of setting up the personal conflict of Silver Snow. Yes, you are loyal to Rhea at this point, but Edelgard was still someone you interacted with for the first half of the game. And with the war still raging, you're going to have to fight Edelgard at one point, setting up a great personal conflict with Byleth slash the player and Edelgard. On Silver Snow, of course, since you did not choose the Blue Lions or Golden Deer, and Edelgard left your team permanently, Sedith basically fills in the gaps where Edelgard once was. Although Edelgard and Hubert will not be on your team for Silver Snow, the rest of the Black Eagles will be. And after reuniting during a fight with some thieves, you and your former students will all decide to team up with the Church of Seros in order to fight the Empire and end the war. As the Church also returned to the monastery at the same day, although this one was out of chance. In this timeline, the church left the monastery in order to search for Rhea, who alongside Byleth had gone missing after the Battle of Garrick Mach. But after five years of searching, they decided to return to the monastery because they could not find her. So now, since your students are officially realigned with the Church of Saros, your goal is to fight Edelgard and the Empire and destroy them, while also hopefully finding Rhea to find out the details of Byleth's path that he's still unsure about. Because although we know Sothis was living in his body, we don't exactly know why. And the missing Rhea seems to hold the answer. So, after the reunion, you and the church take the month to rebuild the monastery to use it as their base, as well as gathering some necessary supplies in order to better fight the Empire. During this first conversation with your students in Sedith, he will go over the current state of the war. Although the Church of Saros isn't out of the war by any means, they are certainly not as strong as they were when they started. The kingdom has pretty much fallen into pieces as the Empire took over, taking over the kingdom from within and apparently killing Dimitri. There are, of course, kingdom territories that still do not like the Empire, but those are few and far between, and they can't really do anything about it. At least, not at the moment. And the Leicester Alliance is pretty much split in two. In the Alliance, it's pretty much 50-50 in terms of who supports Edelgard and who doesn't. So, the situation is not ideal, but not impossible for the Church and Byleth to overcome. With the combined troops of the Knights of Saros, as well as your former Empire students, you decide to call your combined group the Resistance Army, and as a banner, you decide to use the Crest of Flames, which of course is the same crest that Byleth has. After the unveiling of the flag, Byleth has a quick conversation with Sedith and Flane, in which they try to understand Edelgard's methods for why she started the war in the first place, but Sedith and Flane are unable to find any reason why Edelgard should have even started the war to begin with. They do not think that the social landscape that Edelgard wants to create was worth starting a war with the Church of all people. They start to talk about how Byleth was sleeping for the past five years before they are interrupted by a general running in and saying that the Empire is invading the monastery. This makes sense because Edelgard not only knows that Byleth is alive, but has spies to realize that the church are back at the monastery. She did not send the entire imperial army, but she did send a good amount of troops so she can drive the church out of the monastery again. But with the added morale of having Byleth back, the resistance army manages to quell the empire's attack. And with that victory, pretty much making a statement to the empire that they better watch out. The Resistance Army isn't quite ready to take the offensive, though, as the next chapter is dedicated to them getting some more reinforcements from the Alliance. These reinforcements come through Judith, who is one of the most important nobles to Claude, who is now the leader of the Lesser Alliance. They decide to go to the Valley of Torment, which, true to his name, is a very unsafe place to be, as it is said by some people that it was caused by the wrath of the goddess. So, they figure going here will be safe because the Empire won't expect them to put up with the heat that comes with the area. Of course, that does not go as planned, as another spy from the Empire tells them where they're going. So, the Empire sends the Kingdom 
some nobles on their side to go intercept them, forcing another fight. But the Resistance army wins again, allowing them to team up with Judith and finally go on the offensive against the Empire. The first area of importance that the Resistance Army takes over is the Great Bridge of Murden. The reasoning for this is because the Great Bridge of Murden is a very crucial area if you want to get into the Empire. So, if you wanted to eventually get the Enbar, you first had to go through the bridge. This is the first chapter where you get to see firsthand just how dedicated the Imperial soldiers are to Edelgard's goal, which even makes Sedith, who is one of the most important people in the Church of Saros, realize that Edelgard is not some vindictive emperor, and her soldiers are actually dedicated to see her future through. Now, he still disagrees with Edelgard's view of the world, and thinks her future is not worth going to war over, but it makes it clear that Edelgard is not evil or trying to rule the world. Luckily, since you still have your Black Eagles with you, the Great Bridge of Murden doesn't have that many generals, that you would know from the Academy, outside of Lawrence, but really, who gives a crap? After the battle on the bridge, you find Gilbert, a former knight of Seros who has returned to the kingdom, who will reveal that Dimitri, once thought dead, is actually still alive and leading a surge against the Empire. Gilbert will ask Sedith and Byleth if they would join forces with them, or at the very least allow Dimitri's army to cross the bridge, as they are both working towards the same goal. Sedith decides to decline the offer on the former, but decides to let them pass the bridge anyway. After the siege of the Great Bridge of Murden, the Resistance army is extremely weakened, so they need to regroup before they can go and fight anyone else. But regardless, Dimitri's army passes through the Great Bridge of Murden and is ready to pass through Grandir Field. And with Claude's Alliance army, they are also ready to strike against the Empire. At the end of this chapter, things are looking pretty good. That happy feeling is pretty quickly quelled. As soon as you get back to the monastery, a soldier of the church will come in and tell you that there is a bloodbath on Grandir Field. After losing the Great Bridge of Merton, the Empire very smartly also sent forces to Grandir Field to stop anyone that tried to approach further. That meant that Kingdom, Empire, and Alliance forces were all about the fight on Grandir Field. Although Alliance and Kingdom forces were technically on the same side, the chaos that the Empire created was too great to even tell what was going on, forcing all the armies to fight each other, regardless of the banner. This, of course, was very similar to the battle at Grandir Field that the Three Houses did back during the Academy phase. Unlike that mock battle, though, this was real, and nobody won. Edelgard got heavily injured during the fight and got pushed back to Embar. However, the other two armies were also very destroyed after this. Most of the Kingdom's army was killed, including Dimitri, removing the last possible heir to take the throne of Fargus. Similarly, the Alliance was also pretty much completely wiped out. Admittedly, though, the Alliance is better off compared to the Kingdom because Claude is not confirmed dead. All that is stated is that he is currently missing. Although you can assume that he was just not found after the battle or he was taken prisoner by the Empire, let's be honest, if you know who Claude is as a character, knowing the master tactician that people call him, it's very unlikely that he died here. Most likely, he was just heavily injured and pushed back to Almyra, the country of his birth. The story still treats Claude like he's dead here though, and he doesn't appear in the story again in Silver Snow. So although I'm assuming in this route Claude is not left off great, but for this, let's just assume he's off fine. Since you sided with the church, you don't personally have to deal with this battle, which limits the amount of the former students of the monastery that you have to kill, but the consequences of not fighting in this battle leaves everyone in a worse state, except for probably the church, which, you know, isn't a bad thing, but as you're going to see on other routes, actually fighting at Grunder Field ends in less deaths, although still admittedly a lot. Up next is one of the best scenes in Silver Snow. After the news about Grandir, Byleth is outside the monastery late at night. Although it's true that after Grandir Field, you never see Claude in Silver Snow again, the same is not true for Dimitri. Despite Dimitri being pronounced dead, he still finds his way to the monastery and talks to Byleth. Dimitri thought he was dead too, but suddenly he wasn't, and Dimitri decided to go to the monastery in order to talk to Byleth. He expresses his regret for not being able to kill Edelgard at Grandir, and letting so many of his friends die while he supposedly is still alive. Dimitri is clearly unwell over what happened, and he wanted to explain to Byleth what he did. Although, once Sedith shows up, Dimitri disappears. This is one of the most mysterious scenes in the entire game, and that's mostly because it doesn't really have a solid answer on why this is happening. Although, if I had to guess what is happening, it's Dimitri's ghost who is not allowing him to move on. Because if anyone has a lingering regret before they died, it's Dimitri. It is also not revealed what Dimitri had to explain to Byleth, but as you'll see on Verdant Wind, his death was not a noble one. He very abruptly started chasing Edelgard as she retreated by himself, and ended up being impaled by Imperial forces. 
It's highly likely that Dimitri knew what he was doing. He was going to kill Edelgard even if it killed him, and I'm pretty sure he knew going into that attack that even if he was able to kill Edelgard, he would die as well. This is one of the most sad scenes in the game, especially if Silver Snow is not your first route and you have the context of the other routes to understand what is going on. Even if Silver Snow is your first route though, you at least know that Dimitri is likely a ghost, unable to move on because of the demons of his past, condemning a once kind man to spend his days as a miserable ghost. The next chapter has the Resistance Army going to Fort Mercius to take one of the Empire's most powerful bases. Fort Mercius is a crucial point to capture because if they do, they'll be able to enter the Imperial capital of Enbar. To be honest, not too much happens in this chapter. You and your army manage to take over Fort Mercius and forcing the Death Knight to retreat back to Enbar, but Talus and those who slither in the dark weren't having that, and they use a power that they haven't used in a long time, using literal nukes to blow up Fort Mercius because if they they can't have it, nobody can. Obviously, the characters in this game aren't calling them nukes, rather calling them javelins of light, but that's pretty much what they are. Regardless, after that fight, you and your army are ready to go in and fight Edelgard once and for all. You make your way past the streets of Embarf, being forced to kill your former student Hubert, but at last you arrive at the Imperial Throne Room where Edelgard waits for you. The several chapters building up the tension between the fight you're destined to have is done to great effect here. You have a chapter where you fight her, but you spent the entire duration of White Clouds getting to know her, and although this version of Byleth disagrees with what Edelgard is trying to do, he still respects her, which makes the scene after the fight with Edelgard where you kill her even more impactful. The scene was built up pretty much throughout the entire game, even if for most of it you didn't realize it. Although the White Clouds of the Black Eagle route also made you want to sympathize with her and want to side with her, it's also set up in a way where she becomes an enemy you don't want to have. But if you disagree with what she wants for the world, you are forced to kill her, making this scene even more impactful. I want it to walk with you. Killing Edelgard, of course, brings a war against the Empire to a close, although that does not bring an end to the fighting. In the event that he and Edelgard were defeated, Hubert left a note for the victors so that they could take out the real threat to Fodlan. In it, he tells you that you must destroy those who slither in the dark, as that group is a threat to everyone that lives in Fodlan. Since the Empire and the Agarthans were temporarily aligned, Hubert knows where their base is and he gives it to you. Of course, knowing who that group is and what they're capable of, your group decides to destroy that group once and for all. Before that happens though, you also find the whereabouts of Rhea. Of course, she was being kept prisoner in the Imperial capital. You find her in a weak state, which makes sense, but they also didn't really torture her. They just let everyone believe that she was dead in order to reduce the morale of the church. Once Rhea hears about those who slither in the dark, she wants to go with you after she's done healing up. Also promising you that once the fighting with them is over, she will tell you everything about your existence. Those who slither in the dark are found at a location called Shambhala. Compared to the medieval setting that Three Houses is set in, the area of Shambhala is very high-tech and futuristic, which makes sense. They can literally nuke places sometimes, so it makes sense that their base is not really archaic. You fight a lot of these futuristic soldiers and golems and eventually kill Talus as well. But if Talus is gonna go, he's gonna go on his own terms, and he summons more javelins of light from the sky to blow up Shambhala. This would literally kill everybody if one of them hits, so Rhea transforms into a dragon form and takes all the blows. Shambhala still falls, crushing Talus beneath it, but at the very least, none of your army dies from this. It pretty much only kills Talus and some members of those who slither in the dark, so I guess it was a very lucky explosion then. However, for Rhea, she is much less better off. Her dragon form essentially took three nukes, so she is very close to death after this encounter, and requires the entire month before she is ready to tell Byleth about what happened when he was born. After she has recovered a little bit, she still wants Byleth to become the next Archbishop of the Church of Saros, as she stated in Part 1. But before that, she decides to tell Byleth everything that has to do with his creation. She reveals that she is pretty much the main reason that Byleth is alive today. Although this is pretty heavily implied all throughout the story, but it's finally confirmed here that Rhea, Sedith, and Flane are actually the saints from the Church's history. Rhea is actually Saros, the girl that killed Nemesis back in the beginning cutscene of the game. And since Saros is the daughter 
daughter of the goddess Sothis, that also means that Rhea is the actual daughter of Sothis. And with that, it is of course obvious that Sothis being in your head in part 1 was no accident. After Sothis was killed long ago, Rhea held onto her crest stone. Rhea, being the archbishop of the newly created Church of Saros, wanted so badly for her beloved mother to come back to life that she began to do crest experiments, which although weren't to the scale and cruelty of the ones done by those who slither in the dark, it is 100% undeniable that Rhea was not doing a good thing here, as putting the crest stone in someone else's body, she hoped would bring her mother back to life in that body, essentially killing the person of that original body. She didn't kill anybody if it didn't work, but she pretty much just kept on doing it in the hopes that it would. For Byleth, her most recent experiment was done on Byleth's own mother. It did not work once again, but of course his mother ended up giving birth. But since the crest stone pretty much messed up the entire pregnancy process, Byleth was born without a heartbeat. But in an act of wanting to save her newborn baby, Byleth's mother decides to sacrifice herself and tell Rhea to put her crest stone into Byleth instead, which Rhea did, which of course we all know how that went. With Byleth, it kind of worked, as he and Sothis were able to coexist within the same body. This explains why Rhea was just so happy when Byleth's hair turned green, and also explain what the Holy Tomb ritual was, an act to hopefully bring her mother out of Byleth's body. Obviously, what Rhea did was really bad, but what she did wasn't out of malice, it was just out of a desperation to see someone she loved again. This reveal is really cool too, as it recontextualizes a lot of Rhea's actions in Part 1, and humanizes her a lot more when the other routes don't don't really do that. However, this is not the end of Silver Snow. Rhea, so weakened from her situation in Shambhala, loses control of herself, which inducts an ancient rite, with higher members of the church that can also transform into dragons. Rhea is pretty much completely taken over by her dragon form and starts creating chaos around the monastery. Luckily, since Sedith and Flane lost the power to transform into dragons, they can still control themselves, but this also means that you have to fight and maybe kill Rhea, because if you let her dragon form escape, who knows how much of Folan will be destroyed by this. So Byleth, the Black Eagles on your team, the Church of Saros, and anyone else you've recruited on your journey are forced to fight Rhea, someone they've sworn to protect, leading to easily the runner-up best finale in the entire game. The last battle isn't a big or triumphant one, it's a very oh no, what are we doing kind of feel, and the music reflects that. It's a solemn conclusion where you're forced to fight and maybe even kill one of your former allies, especially someone who means so much to Sedith, Flane, and maybe even Byleth depending on how much you interact with her in White Clouds. Your group manages to fight Rhea and the other dragons, defeating her once and for all. With very little of her life remaining, Rhea flies off towards the monastery and Byleth follows. Her dragon form starts to fade away after being defeated, with her human form falling slowly in the cathedral of the monastery. Byleth runs up to her and catches her, and she falls into his arms as she's laying on the ground. She looks up to Byleth and tells him happily that her mother is finally here. Now, whether or not she's imagining things as she's dying, or if somehow, some way, Sothis managed to take over Byleth's body one last time so she could see her daughter. Rhea falls asleep and most likely dies after this. Now, not only is the scene very visually striking, it's a fitting end to Rhea's character in this game. Now, obviously, this is not the only outcome for her, but it is by far my favorite one for her, as it ties up the character of Rhea very nicely, and it's another one of the saddest death scenes in the game. Now, technically, if you get Rhea's support up to A in White Clouds, she can be spared here, and she will be confirmed to be alive in the epilogue to Silver Snow. And since to do this, you have to get her support up to A, it is possible to romance Rhea, so technically she got saved by the power of love, but honestly, I'm fine with it. Although what I just said was heavily implying that Rhea died there, it wasn't technically confirmed, it was merely implied. So I don't really mind her being confirmed to be alive here, because at the very least, she wasn't shown to be dead before this point, so honestly, it could have been worse. The conclusion of Silver Snow has Byleth becoming the next Archbishop of the Church of Saros, and with all three major regions pretty much caught up in shambles, the Church of Saros is the one that unifies Fodlin under their rule. However, although the ending is happy, Edelgard, Dimitri, and possibly Claude are dead here, so it's a little sad to think about. And if you're a person that's more critical on the Church of Saros, it might not be your preferred ending. But with that being said, Silver Snow is still a really good route. The central conflict with Edelgard and later 
Vader Rhea are very well done, and also has some of my favorite scenes in the entire game, and to one of my favorite ending cutscenes, and even answers a lot of the questions about Byleth's upbringing. However, out of the four routes, this is only my third favorite, partially because the two routes I like more have stronger storylines and more resonant character arcs, but also because my least favorite route in the game comes in and kind of ruins it, at least partially. I suppose now we should move over and talk about Verdant Wind, the Alliance route. And to be honest, there is not much to break down here because I pretty much just covered it. What you're thinking right now is exactly what I mean. Verdant Wind is pretty much just a reskin of the Silver Snow route, but with Claude and the Golden Deer instead. Let's quickly go through all the major changes. Firstly, the obvious one, you're with Claude and the Golden Deer, so obviously the Alliance is going to end up winning the day. Instead of retreating back to the monastery after sieging the Great Bridge of Murden, you and the Alliance actually fight on this battle, making it so only two armies get decimated. Thirdly, after fighting the Agarthans randomly out of nowhere, Nemesis is just brought back to life with no explanation. This just doesn't happen on Silver Snow, even though the lead-up to the events is pretty much identical, and with that, Nemesis is going to be your final boss rather than Rhea. Which makes it even weirder why in this route, Rhea just doesn't turn into a dragon and go berserk, but in Silver Snow she does? Like, I don't know what's up with that. Don't get me wrong, the fight against Nemesis is fun from a gameplay and a music level, but it just doesn't make sense story-wise. During the final chapter, you get different bits of information more tailored to what Claude wants to hear, rather than what Byleth does, and the ending will have the Alliance unifying Folan and Claude leaving for Amira. And that's about it. Everything else is pretty much shot for shot from Silver Snow. Verdant Wind still tries to push this connection between you and Edelgard, even though you barely spent any time with her in Part 1 in this route. The cutscene where she dies is literally identical, and she still says, my teacher, even though you weren't. And the journey is still pretty much the same, and everything else is practically the same. Swap in the Golden Deer rather than the Black Eagles and have Claude be a part of it, and it's pretty much the same thing. Having this route be a shot for shot of Silver Snow makes this by far the worst route in the game and one of the most disappointing things I had while playing. And for those of you that say that this could be the better one since Silver Snow could technically be a copy of it, but that's not even true because the developer said that Silver Snow was the first route they made. And even if Verdant Wind was the first one made, Silver Snow would still be the better route because the conflicts are just so much better. And now that brings me to probably my most contentious point I'll make in this entire video. This will probably make someone mad, but let me explain. There are several students on the Golden Deer that I like. Claude, Marianne, Hilda, Lysithia, and maybe even Lawrence, but it is still by far the weakest house in the game. The ones I didn't mention are very mediocre characters, and that's about half the house. The Golden Deer's Part 2 in Vert and Win is by far the worst route in the game, and I don't even think it comes close. And that's why I've covered the Golden Deer in this entire video substantially less than the Black Eagles and the Blue Lions, as they are definitely the most misused group of characters in the game. I think a supposed route where instead of fighting Edelgard or the Church, the Golden Deer instead focuses on the troubles outside of Fodlin, it could have been kind of interesting. Or at the very least, have the War of Fodlin not be the center point of attention, and just have it be something that you're trying to stay neutral in. Every other route has the Alliance being neutral in the war at some point, so why couldn't we just do the same here, and cover more stuff outside of Fotlin. I mean, they kind of do this in Fire Emblem Warriors 3 Hopes, this game's spin-off, but that's not really a fixed solution because that game really isn't canon. It's more of a what-if scenario. And you can make the argument that that would make the Golden Deer feel less important to the story because their focuses aren't on the central conflict of the war. And although that is a valid point, the Golden Deer aren't really connected to the war anyway, at least when it comes to its leader, Claude. The main conflict comes between Edelgard, Dimitri, and Rhea trying to to decide how the crest system should be changed. Claude is more focused on solving the racial tensions between the neighboring countries rather than that issue, so I don't think it was outside the realm of possibility that this could have potentially happened. Again, this is another situation where the game's scale outweighed its budget, so sadly, again, they had to cut corners here. It's definitely sad to see the Golden Deer are so poorly used, but again, I can understand why it is the way it is, even if it's disappointing to me. In terms of leaving the least amount of unanswered questions, Verdant Wind is definitely the best at that though, so there's that. But now, let's move on and talk about Azure Moon. Am I?
On Azure Moon, you wake up in the same riverbed, and of course decide to go back to the monastery to meet up with your students. Upon entering the Goddess Tower, the first person you see is of course Dimitri, who is somehow in a worse state than when you left him five years ago. In case you forgot because it was a little bit since I brought it up, but Dimitri basically lost his mind upon learning that Edelgard was the Flame Emperor, believing her to be the cause of the tragedy of Dusker and everything that's happened in the kingdom, vowing to take her life to appease the souls of those who were lost. At the end of White Clouds, Dimitri Dimitri is very maniacal, and this continues into Azure Moon as well. These last five years have brought Dimitri even further down his vengeful path. Even when you find him, you can find the bodies of some Imperial soldiers that Dimitri killed when they tried to kill him. Dimitri is absolutely not for conversation right now, as his main goal is killing Edelgard and any other thing beyond that is a mere distraction. And in his mind, he's basically an arbiter for all the deceased souls. He might not be as maniacal as when he initially snapped, but he's arguably worse here because now he's just bitter. He basically has said at this point that he's killed hundreds of people, all because he said that they deserved it. And as soon as you find him for the first time, he immediately enlists you to go kill some bandits that have been stealing around the monastery. And he's not really giving you a choice here, because whether or not you want to, he's going to go do it anyway. So Byleth is pretty much forced to help him, not only for Dimitri's sake, but also the thieves' sake, because who knows what Dimitri would do if Byleth was not around. This opening is pretty sad, because instead of the happy reunion you get with Claude and Edelgard and their respective routes, on Azure Moon you find a broken man who is so tortured that he thinks you are initially there to torment him because he believes you are dead. Fighting off the bandits will also lead to the reunion with the rest of the Blue Lions. Just like the reunion cutscenes on the other routes, this scene is mostly there to explain what has been happening in the war since you were gone, as well as being able to interact with your students who are now 5 years older. Not gonna lie, the current state of the war in Azure Moon is not that different compared to Silver Snow, but there is a little bit of a difference, so I'm gonna bring that up real quick. This difference is of course from the Kingdom side. Dimitri, of course, was set to be executed in the Kingdom just like in Silver Snow, because of a Kingdom noble with heavy ties to the Empire, and those who slither in the dark, but the characters don't know that yet, named Cornelius trying to put a baseless crime on Dimitri and BSing her way into convicting him, but right before his execution, he is saved by Dudu, Dimitri's right-hand man who vows to take his place so that Dimitri can live, allowing him to escape. So on this route, instead of believing that Dimitri is dead, you believe that Dudu is dead. After this, the Church of Zeros show up. You and your blue lions minus Dimitri decide to help the church find Rhea and take down the Empire. Dimitri does go along with this, as it will help him take down Edelgard, but basically he's gonna do whatever he wants, and he's only joining because the firepower would be useful. Now, the first couple chapters of Azure Moon do play out very similarly to Silver Snow and Verdant Wind, and since you're about to hear me talk very highly on Azure Moon, you might think I'm a giant hypocrite, because I was very critical on Verdant Wind for having basically the same chapter layout as Silver Snow, while I'm so positive on Azure Moon, but there are two reasons I don't think I'm being a hypocrite here. One, it doesn't literally copy every single chapter from Silver Snow like Verdant Wind does, and two, although the specific missions you're going on are the same, the story content and how it pushes to me storyline is not the same. Yes, the first chapter is defending the monastery, but Azure Moon's version gives a lot heavier of a focus of getting to know the general that is invading the monastery. This general is named Randolph, and in this timeline you actually get to meet his sister beforehand. The scene with Randolph and his sister is great because it humanizes the Imperial Army, which on this timeline obviously does not get much in that department. Instead of Randolph dying on this section as he does in other routes, Dimitri instead captures him, and very cruelly tells him that he's not going to kill him until all of his friends are dead. Dimitri thinks that he and Randolph are the same. Dimitri argues that Randolph is simply a monster who's trying to hide what he's doing, justifying all the people he killed through the lens of protecting the Empire and his family. This scene works really well because although you're on Dimitri's side, you actually start sympathizing with Randolph instead. The scene where he's talking about protecting his sister is shown right before this, so you see he's not some evil guy who's just killing people for the heck of it. He has a family to protect and he wants to create the future that Edelgard wants. And watching Dimitri essentially emotionally torture him is a very sad sight because you know that Dimitri is in the wrong here. He is a good person at heart, but he's so blinded by his hate that he's going to basically torture this guy because of Dimitri viewing him as a monster. Which granted, yes, it's probably true that Randolph has killed a lot of people, and Dimitri offers up a great question for the player to answer for themselves. 
does war justify it? In actuality, Dimitri is just deluding himself, trying to justify the awful stuff he's done as saying he's only punishing those who deserve it. Byleth doesn't like what he sees, so he comes in and mercy kills Randolph, which sparks another scene with Randolph's sister Flaish, where she vows revenge on Dimitri. More on that later. The next chapter, where you go to ALL for reinforcements, is also, in concept, similar to the other routes, but Azure Moon has definitely the best execution of the routes that have this particular chapter. Instead of getting reinforcements from Judith, who even on the Golden Deer path doesn't really have that strong of a connection to the main plot, you instead get reinforcements from Felix's father, Rodrigue, a character you got to meet in Part 1, and someone who has strong connections to not only Felix, but Dimitri as well. This battle with the Empire-controlled kingdom also feels more personal because you are on the side of the kingdom. So after the spy from Garrig Mach informs the quote-unquote traitors, it becomes a personal battle between two sides of the kingdom. It's not the best chapter in the game still, but it's much better than on the other routes. And now, with Roderick lending directly to your army, it reopens the storyline with Felix and his strained relationship. And Roderick will prove to be a very important player when it comes to Dimitri's redemption. Although it'll be a couple chapters before that comes to fruition. Next chapter, again, is the same similar setup, and again, it's probably the best version of the Great Bridge Immersion chapter, at least in the routes where you're fighting the Empire. In this chapter, you have two students that you are forced to fight and probably kill, Ferdinand and Lawrence, two men who are, again, good people who are trying to do the right thing. Dimitri still doesn't care who he has to kill, even trying to use what happened with Gerald and White Clouds in order to justify why he's so set on killing Imperial Generals. And with those two students, it's only possible to spare one of them, and even that one, that one being Lawrence for those of you that don't know, can only be saved if you actually interacted with him a bunch in White Clouds. During this exchange, Felix even has a great speech, where he basically tells Byleth that it's not because of Dimitri that the army has managed to even make any headway against the Empire. He says that everyone in the war has lost someone, and in his words, all Dimitri is doing is stacking up more corpses. Throughout the dark phase of Dimitri's character, he will constantly be bombarded with the supposed souls of the dead who are yelling at him to kill Edelgard. But upon clearing the Great Bridge of Murden, one of those souls is actually revealed to still be alive. That person, obviously, as you can see on screen, is Dudu. This is explained as although Dudu did take Dimitri's place to be executed, he was also rescued by the people of Dusker, who healed Dudu up enough so he could go back and help Dimitri. This is where the cracks in Dimitri's cold demeanor start to shatter, because two supposed dead souls that have been tormenting him being revealed to be alive because it makes him question whether or not the supposed souls of his lost friends are actually demanding Edelgard be dead, or if it's just him not being able to let go. I'll give you a hint, it's the latter. With the dude back in the army, the kingdom, and the church are ready to go through Grandra Field, but before that happens, Randolph's sister comes in asking for a job working for the kingdom, probably so she can afford a PS5. Now, I know I'm kind of repeating myself here, but surprise surprise, the Grandra Field chapter in Azure Moon is the best of the routes it appears in. Not just for the people that actually fought there, because the alliance isn't completely wiped out, and neither is the kingdom, but also because this holds the best scene in the entire game. I know I've talked a lot about how scenes can be really amazing, but this is for real the best one. Dimitri is, of course, at his most aggressive on the Battle of Grandeur Field. This is the first time Dimitri has seen Edelgard in person in the last five years, and of course, still has a big bloodlust for her. After the battle, Edelgard is retreating, and Dimitri, of course, wants to just go after her with no repercussions, which will, of course, lead to his death. Roderick prevents Dimitri from running after Edelgard, and when Dimitri isn't looking, is stabbed by Randolph's sister, who decided that now was the time to kill Dimitri. Flash tries to stab Dimitri again to kill him, but Roderick blocks it, taking the brutal blow in his place. Flaish arguably has just as much bloodlust for Dimitri as Dimitri does for Edelgard. I think that's important to mention as it shows the real consequences that have come from Dimitri's senseless killing. Roderick's death is a very sad one for Dimitri, as if there was no one there to guide Dimitri, then Roderick would probably end up being one of the quote-unquote souls that are tormenting him. He makes it very clear before he dies that no one died for Dimitri. They all died for what they believe in. So Roderick tells Dimitri that he should not become a martyr for all those lost souls, telling Dimitri before he passes that he should live for himself. 
There is even a great flashback during this death scene that shows that Lambert did not have any ill will at all, telling Rodrigue that before he goes to Dusker that even if he were to die there, he would hope that Dimitri would still grow up to be a kind and respectable man. This is amazing because it adds extra context to an event back in part 1 where Dimitri first tells you of his revenge plot. As the words his father says as he's dying at Dusker probably is just a figment of Dimitri's imagination manifesting itself after the event. This isn't really confirmed or even implied in the route itself, but it's what I and many others believe is the intention, as it makes a lot of sense. Now, this is off script, but I probably should mention that the YouTuber Fargas is the first person that I've seen to bring this up as a possibility, so again, just wanted to mention that real quick. After losing Rodrigue and returning to the monastery, an extremely emotional Dimitri decides to head out to Embar without telling anyone. Dimitri is reeling in this scene. He had just lost one of his closest friends. That friend had just told them that he should not be living for the souls of the dead, and at that point, that was pretty much all Dimitri was living for, finding a way to avenge those who were lost in Dusker. So now, Dimitri doesn't know what he's supposed to live for. This scene is basically the beginning of the redemption arc for Dimitri. The bitter and lost Dimitri is now dead, and in his place comes a better man who is now equipped to deal with all his past trauma and right his wrongs. Especially for those who are really attached to Dimitri's character, this scene works really well at delivering an emotional gut punch. For Dimitri, this is a gigantic weight off his shoulders. He's finally letting go of all of the hate he has built up inside of him and finding a purpose for living outside of that revenge. Dimitri will become a much better person after this. Not to say he wasn't kind or good intentioned, but this improved mental state will help him and Fargus in the future. And all he needed to make that giant step was just a helping hand of his friends. It sounds kind of corny when I'm saying it out loud, but believe me, within the context of the game, it is not. This scene is also made even better by the incredible performances of Dimitri's voice actor. Especially in this scene, there is so much nuance in the lines he's giving. You can tell he's emotional in trying to let go of his hate, but not being able to let go it completely until the helping hand comes. I am a murderous monster. My hands are stained red. Could one such as I truly hope for such a life? As the sole survivor of that day, do I... Do I have the right to live for myself? After this point in the game, the story of Azermoon breaks off the path that Silver Snow had. After finding something to live for, Dimitri decides to temporarily stop pushing on Empire territory and instead save his people from the kingdom that are currently suffering over Empire control. But before going over that, I want to pause for a second here and go over more differences between Azermoon and Silver Snow's story, because there is another major storyline outside of Dimitri's character arc that sets it apart. Another storyline unique to the first half of Azermoon is the mystery surrounding the tragedy of Dusker and who really caused it. This storyline is pretty much present throughout the entirety of the Blue Lions part of Three Houses, but, but especially in Azur Moon. Most people in the kingdom just assumed it was the people of Dusker who caused it, outside of a select few, one of them being Dimitri, who does not believe they caused it, and he is a direct person that was there that day. Azur Moon does a really good job creating a mystery surrounding that. It goes over a lot of inconsistencies within the reports, which leads to a lot of questions over potential people that could have instigated it. The story the story basically clears the men of Dusker of causing it, and pretty much confirms that those who slither in the dark had at least some connection to the tragedy, but there are also several more suspects that are never fully confirmed whether or not they were. Obviously, for much of the game, Dimitri believes that Edelgard is the one to have caused it, although given she probably would have been around 9, it would not make sense for her to do it, and it probably makes more sense that Dimitri at that time was basically just making Edelgard a figurehead, but there is also suspicion thrown around some minor kingdom nobles, or even Dimitri's stepmother, so potentially it could have been an inside job. There are quite a number of scenes dedicated to investigating it, and it is 100% a driving force of the narrative the entire way through. My favorite part about this mystery is that it's never really fully revealed. Sure, there are a lot of people that you can assume are a part of creating the tragedy, but those are just that, assumptions. They never really confirm whether or not a certain person was connected to the tragedy, other than kind of those who slither in the dark. But that should not be a shock for anyone. And I think that fits really well with the story Azure Moon is trying to tell, as hyperfixating on the tragedy of Dusker is what led Dimitri down his dark path to begin with. 
There are some more stuff regarding this storyline that I want to bring up, but I'll save it till the end of this section. So, as mentioned before, Dimitri decides to switch course and go for the Kingdom Capital rather than the Imperial one, much to the delight of his allies. And that's exactly what they do. They march into the Kingdom Capital of Ferdiad and kill Cornelia, an Imperial Loyalist, who has been treating the people of the Kingdom terribly after she came into power. With Ferdiad now saved, Dimitri has to face his people. He is reluctant at first, but with some guiding words from Gilbert, Dadu, and Byleth, he decides to face them, finding an overjoyed crowd of people. Dimitri thought that they would resent him for abandoning them for so long, but the people of Fargus are just happy to have him back, and he is officially crowned as king. After freeing Fargus, there is a grand feast to revel in the return of the new king. During a conversation between Byleth and Dimitri, a messenger from the Alliance shows up with a request from Claude to help the Alliance as they are currently under fire from the Empire and they're at their last stand. Showing the character growth that Dimitri has gone through, he again accepts the offer to protect the Alliance, pushing off invading the Empire for the greater good of Fodlan. Claude is, of course, grateful for your help. But after you save the Alliance capital of Deirdre, Claude decides to get rid of the Alliance entirely, merging it once again with the Kingdom. Claude even gives you his hero's relic, the Bow Failnot, telling you to use it however you want. Claude's reasoning for disbanding the Alliance is because in this new Fodlan were the Kingdom to end up winning the war, Dimitri would be the primary ruler. Claude likes his future a heck of a lot more than Edelgard's future, so he'd rather step down as leader now, helping the Kingdom beat the Empire rather than later. And once again, Claude will tell you he's leaving Foblin, and he hops on his wyvern and flies away, probably to Almira. So, of course, this is the last time you will see Claude in Azur Moon. But now, with the Alliance and Kingdom protected, they are finally ready to go and fight the Empire. Before you can get the march on Enbar, you have to take out the impregnable fortress of Fort Mercius. There is a pretty unique scene that can happen if you have Mercedes in your party and you have her kill a Death Knight in this chapter. And it's kind of a sad scene considering that the two characters are brother and sister, but it's pretty much just a chapter where all the pieces are falling in your place for the final confrontation. Before any battle takes place though, Dimitri does one last attempt to try to stop the conflict with the Empire without fighting. He requests a meeting with Edelgard, and she surprisingly accepts. This scene is yet another key point in Dimitri's character arc, as he would never have done this at any point in the game, even in the Academy phase, but to see him attempt to come to terms with Edelgard and to make an attempt for them to see things eye to eye and solve things peacefully is a big step for him. During this scene, Dimitri and Edelgard argue whether or not the war was worth starting. To Edelgard, of course, it was, as she believes that it would cause less deaths in the long run rather than sitting idly by doing nothing, while the Crest system and by extension the Church of Saros she believes caused all this injustice just continues to go on. Dimitri just can't see this way of thinking. Even if what she wants is a good thing, throwing a bunch of civilians into a war will ravage a large percent of the population's livelihood. Dimitri doesn't believe that this future can be created like that. As he stated in White Clouds, he believes the best way to get rid of something like the Crest system is to do it one step at a time, rather than trying to fix everything at once. Dimitri also doesn't believe that the Church of Saros is at the guilt for all of the stuff the Crest system has created. He says that her pushing her ideals on people is just self-righteousness. She even agrees with this to some extent, although she still believes that she is right with what she's doing. They also have very different ideals on how weak or strong humans are in general. All of these disagreements make them realize that they can never fully understand each other and that they cannot solve this without conflict. But before Dimitri and Edelgard are ready to go a war against each other, there is one last thing Dimitri must say. Now, remember quickly back to part 1. Dimitri and Edelgard used to be extremely close for a while before she had to go back to the Empire. Dimitri gave her a dagger as a parting gift, something she's held on to to this very day, even if she doesn't really remember why. As after she returned to the Empire, she would soon go under terrible crest experiments that would make her memory of the past foggy. During her Flame Emperor phase, she actually threw the dagger at Dimitri, but Dimitri of course still held on to it. So now, with the final battle so close, Dimitri decides to give the dagger back to Edelgard, giving her the same message he gave her when they were little. This pretty much unlocks her memory of Dimitri when they were little. This temporarily fills Edelgard with a lot of happiness as she remembers the great times her and Dimitri had when they were little, 
and before leaving, thanks him for the happiest time of her life. Although I've gone over my favorite scene in the game, and this time I'm not changing that opinion, but if there were any scene in Three Houses that perfectly encapsulates what the narrative of Three Houses is trying to tell, it would undoubtedly be this one. The central conflict is so perfectly told, two people that were once really close with differing worldviews that caused them to go fight each other, and now with a tad bit of melancholy prepare for the final battle that would decide Fodlin's future. The final battle begins in the streets of Enbar. The Empire puts up a good fight, but with the combined forces from the Kingdom, Alliance, and the Church, the Empire was defeated in the streets, yet there are still more forces to be found in the throne room where Edelgard lies. However, before you reach the throne room, Edelgard realizes she's at her wit's end. When she says she'll do anything to get the future she believes is best for Fodlin, she means anything. Her back is now against the wall, most of her forces lost, and her second in command is dead. Edelgard still wants to do something, so she does a very forbidden rite that will transform her into a literal monster, all so she can create the future that she wants. Edelgard is without a doubt ambitious, but this is to an extreme extent. This monster form will also exaggerate her thoughts, all so that she'll never give up. She'll either win, or die trying. Your army reaches the throne room, seeing Edelgard in this form, and realizes that she is too far gone. If this is the extent she's willing to go through, then there is no way she's gonna let you win the war without you killing her. You and your army fight through the last remaining Imperial soldiers, and eventually strike down Hegemon Edelgard. However, defeating that monster does not kill her. It returns her to her human form. Dimitri tries one more time to end the war without her dying, offering his hand to help her off the ground. However, Edelgard lost, and she knows it. The future she wants to create is now gone forever, and she cannot live with that. So, she pulls out the dagger that Dimitri gave her, and tries to stab him. You can assume that this was Edelgard's last stand, but I don't really think it was. She was just too attached to her ideals, so she couldn't let the future she wanted fade away, as she'll probably spend the rest of her life in prison. Dimitri then stabs her with his lance, and the war is over. Dimitri and Byleth walk away to rejoin their army. Dimitri initially tries to turn around and go back to Edelgard, but Byleth stops him and leads him into the light, concluding as her moon. Dimitri goes on to become a great ruler for his people, and Fodlin will eventually rely on Kress less as time passes. My most popular video on this channel is a ranking of the four routes of three houses, and in that video I put Azermoon at number two. However, a lot of time has passed since that video. My opinion has changed, and I now think that Azermoon is the greatest route in Fire Emblem Three Houses. Although at a very surface level, it has some similarities to Silver Snow, although as I've gone over, that is only in gameplay alone. The story has a much different feeling, and it is in my opinion much stronger. Dimitri's character arc is the best in the entire game, and the mystery surrounding Tragedy of Dusker is very well explored upon. Edelgard is an incredible antagonist. She is well-intentioned and even right depending on the person you ask, but this route shows that her ambition ends up destroying her, transforming her into a literal monster. She's an even better antagonist if you played her route first, as being able to see the good things that Edelgard can create, seeing the levels that she'll stoop to here, really emphasizes the dangers of being too stuck in one's ways. Throughout the entire route, there is a great emotional core to everything, making it feel more personal. I really can't emphasize enough how much I like the story in Azure Moon. However, I do have a criticism for Azure Moon, despite how much I liked it. You might have noticed that the Church and those who slither in the dark don't really play that big of a role here. With the Church, it's absolutely fine. They still join your team at the beginning of Part 2, and it makes sense that Rhea does not play a large part in Azure Moon, considering that she's been an Embar the entire time, and that's the last chapter you do. However, those who slither in the dark's non-involvement in Azermoon is a bit more confusing. They are a massive threat to literally every side of the conflict. They are also the people that cause the tragedy of Dusker, making them a very important faction for Dimitri to fight against. However, although you do fight against those who slither in the dark in the story, it's very non-involved. You fight and kill Cornelia without realizing she's part of those who slither in the dark. You even kill Talus, the leader of the Agarthans in the Deirdre chapter, when he is in his Lord Arendelle form. So you can kill him without even realizing that you killed probably the most important Agarthan that you could possibly fight. Although you can find this out by playing the other route, it should still at least reveal that he's Talus. But if you don't know, then you're just left wondering what the heck happened with that. 
As Tallis is dying, he just says, Ooh, Dimitri and Edelgard, you should kill each other because you're family. And he's just gone. You never go to Shambhala and destroy the rest of the Agarthans, they're just there. Which is a very weird omission. Even though the epilogue states that Dimitri does a really good job as king, the Agarthans are still around, and the only mention of them is an optional paired ending with Dimitri and a DLC character. So it's just kinda weird all around. However, even with that criticism, and I think it's a pretty valid one, Azure Moon is still great nonetheless. Now, there is only one more route to talk about, so let's finish off with the most unique route in Three Houses, Crimson Flower. The reason Crimson Flower is the most unique route of the four should be obvious. This is the only route in the entire game where you actually team up with Edelgard rather than fighting her. However, that is not the only thing. This is also by far the shortest route in the game, as the length of Crimson Flower is around 7 chapters compared to the other routes 10 or 11. I think that's pretty important to note, because depending on who you ask, this could be a good or bad thing. Some people think it feels rushed, while others think it's perfectly paced. I don't particularly agree with with either of those viewpoints, but I suppose I should probably cover the story before I get into that. Crimson Flower begins with pretty much the same constant that begins all the other routes. You wake up in the River Valley five years after the attack on Garrick Mach. However, this time it's different. Garrick Mach is not abandoned as it is in the other routes, the Empire is still there. When Byleth returns to the monastery, the first person he finds is, of course, Edelgard, who, in contrast to her appearance at the beginning of Silver Snow, is overjoyed to see Byleth. She says that she never stopped looking for Byleth after he disappeared five years ago, and that she had been leading the Empire and the Black Eagle Strike Force the best she could in his absence. I think it's imperative to also mention that this is the only route where when you return to the monastery, your students have been there for the past five years. They have been helping Edelgard as key Imperial generals. Instead of how it is on the other three routes, where they basically just do their own thing for five years and then reconnect at the monastery. I'm not saying one is particularly better or worse, but just that it's important for Crimson Flower that they had been there the entire time. When you arrive to the monastery, the war is at a stalemate. After losing the monastery to the Empire, the Church decided to make their base in the Kingdom, using them as their shield. And the Alliance is once again divided on who they want to side with, but trying to stay neutral. Claude is actually neutral in this route instead of pretending to be while actually being against the Empire in the other routes. So with the two sides not being able to gain any ground, there is nothing to be done. However, now they got the Sword of the Creator and Byleth, so they are going to try to push on the Alliance to get them to join the Empire side so they can shift the state of the war. So Edelgard tells you in the Black Eagle Strike Force that you need to set out for the Great Bridge of Murden and take that. Because in this route, apparently keeping the Monastery has caused them to not gain the Great Bridge of Murden, or maybe the developers are trying to find another way to reuse that Great Bridge of Murden map. It doesn't really matter. Before you're ready to go do that, though, Hubert will have a conversation with you that explains that they need to work with those who slither in the dark in order to win the war. He explains that although the Church of Seraphs and those who slither in the dark are enemies to Fodlan, and by extension the Empire, as Hubert states, is pretty much an enemy of my enemy situation, as those who slither in the dark hate the Church of Seraphs, and although they're definitely a crappy group of people, Edelgard believed that they could not win the war without their help. Hubert also tells you that after the war with the Church is done, they plan on making another one with with the Agarthans, although this time secretly. Edelgard obviously has a lot of negative history with the Agarthans, as does a lot of other people. So I think it's good that the game gave a satisfying reasoning for why she's doing that, because it wouldn't make sense on the other routes for her to tell you as you're fighting against her. But of course, even though they're technically helping you, you don't actually have to interact with any of them outside of Lord Arendelle, as if they would have done that, I think it would have been a mistake. But hey, you actually get the Death Knight as one of your party members now, so that's pretty cool. You take down the Great Bridge of Murden without much trouble, and are ready to go to the Alliance capital of Deirdre, where Claude awaits. Once you reach Deirdre in the next chapter, Claude is pretty much prepared for every single scenario. He isn't called the Master Tactician for nothing, and he has plans set up whether or not he loses or wins. Claude even went so far as to telling one of his allies to join up with the Empire during the battle, if push came to shove. That ally, by the way, is Lysithia, who, if you remember all the way back to the character section, went through the same horrid crest experiments that Edelgard went through. So it makes sense for her to join you here. I mean, technically you don't have to spare her, but why would you not? 
Speaking of sparing, after you defeat Claude, as long as you got his health down to zero by either Byleth or Edelgard, you are given the choice on whether or not you want to kill him or spare him. Crimson Flower could be the only route where Claude ends up dying. Ooh, compare that to Edelgard and Dimitri, who each die in three of the four routes, but that's neither here nor there. But I don't really see that many people intentionally choosing to kill Claude. They might end up killing him with the wrong person, meaning that he can't be spared, but if they're given the option, why would Claude be someone you'd want to kill rather than spare? Claude is one of the most likable characters in the game, and if you've only played Crimson Flower, even then he is still trying to be neutral. So you don't really have any strong motivation to want to kill him. And of course, that's not a bad thing. You obviously shouldn't. But sparing him, much like how he ends up in Azure Moon and to a lesser extent Silver Snow, doesn't really affect the narrative at all. He just again hops on his wife Ern and flies away to Almira, which is something he does a lot. Man, he really does like running away. The Empire doesn't absorb the Alliance, but they do team up, meaning that they can attack the Kingdom with more firepower. For the record, if I talk about Claude again on this route, I'll keep referring to him as if he's alive, as I feel that's what most players, Byleth and this version of Edelgard, would do in that situation. There is one chapter between getting the Alliance on your side and fighting the Kingdom slash Church of Saros. This chapter isn't too heavy on story, as it's just them preparing to get their army ready to march on the Kingdom. The Black Eagle Strike Force do discuss what they're planning on doing, but their plans can't be executed until the next month, as they are interrupted before they can set out. Leading up to the end of the month, there's really only one important conversation that you have, and calling it important is definitely an overstatement. You have a conversation with Edelgard late at night where she discusses her fear of rats. This is stemmed from when she was locked up in the dungeons beneath the palace when those who slid there in the dark were doing experiments on her. I guess you can say the scene develops on her character a little bit as she opens up to you, but I don't know, I think that's stretching it. I think the actual point makes itself clear when you find a drawing of Byleth on Edelgard's desk. So I think it's pretty obvious what the point of this scene was. I'm not saying this scene is particularly bad, just that there's not really much going on before it, so I kind of had to bring it up. The main reason you don't go into the kingdom during this chapter is, of course, because the Knights of Saros are invading the monastery to try to regain it back. This group of knights has a lot of familiar faces, the two biggest ones being Sedith and Flane. Before you fight them, though, you get a quick little scene with Sedith and Flane, a conversation where they basically imply that no matter what happens at Garrick Mach, that will be their last time fighting with the church, as Sedith plans for him and Flane to go back to a quiet life as he fears for her safety. Of course, because you're on the Empire's side, they will end up winning this bout against the church, but like Claude's situation from a couple chapters ago, Seth and Flane's fate is in your hands. Depending on your actions in the battle, Seth and Flane can either die or be spared. Like the situation with Claude, it also doesn't really matter for the story whether or not you spare them or not, as it doesn't really affect the story at large, but regardless, they're out of the story after this. Yet again, this is another situation where you're more likely to accidentally kill them rather than intentionally. Feeding them with Byleth or Edelgard will lead them to be spared, while anyone else will kill them. Much like with Claude, with the relationship that you see with Sedith and Flane, you're not likely to want them dead. Especially when you see the scene with them talking about it being their last battle anyway. So again, like with Claude, I'm just gonna go through the story assuming they're alive. However, the scene after the battle where Rhea reacts to whatever happened to Sedith and Flane is much better done if they end up dying. The anger on that version of things feels much more genuine compared to this one. It does a phenomenal job being a great villain scene for Rhea, leaving the scene version with Sedith and Flame being alive feeling kind of forced by comparison. After dealing with that situation, the Empire is ready to start attacking the Kingdom. Edelgard lets everyone know that they're going to be attacking the Kingdom capital. However, Edelgard is pulling a fast one on the Agarthans here, as she actually intends for her and the Black Eagle Strike Force to go to the fortress city of Arianode in Kingdom territory. The mage Cornelia is stationed there, and she's heavily implied by Edelgard to be a member of those who slither in the dark. So she wants to go in and kill Cornelia, which will weaken those who slither in the dark, while staging it as just an attack to get better footing in the kingdom. So at the end of the month, you, Edelgard, and the rest of the Black Eagles go in and take Arianhode, much to the anger of the Agarthans. Obviously, Edelgard uses an excuse and why she lied and went to Arianhode rather than Ferdiad. Arendelle slash Talus obviously doesn't believe this, but since their goals are still aligned to take down the church, he can't do anything directly to hurt Edelgard. However, he still shows in this scene that the Agarthans are still not to be messed with. He leaves a veiled thread about hoping that the Empire will not become another Aryan road, and then immediately leaves without explaining what he means. It doesn't really take long to figure out what he meant though, as Hubert runs in saying that Pillars of Light has disintegrated Aryan Hode. 
which again is code for nukes, the same ones that they used on Shambhala and the Impregnable Fortress on Silver Snow and Verdant Wind. Obviously, Edelgard and Hubert are forced to keep quiet about who actually caused these javelins of light to fall, but it still sets up a great battle that should come between those who slither in the dark and the Empire. Regardless, the Empire still has to push on, moving their way into the heart of the kingdom to take down the church once and for all. There are only two chapters left in Crimson Flower, and they save the best for last. At the beginning of the penultimate chapter, there is a conversation between Dimitri and Rhea. They are well aware that the Empire is on their doorstep, and they are prepared for a fight. Rhea wants to make a storyline out of the battle, so she makes it that no matter what, it will take place at the Tail Team Plains, where definitely not Rhea fought and killed Nemesis years and years ago. She also completely randomly decides to have all of her allies start calling her Seros from now on, so it's clear that she's trying to use that to recreate history using Edelgard and Byleth as her nemesis figure. So if her and her Seros name were to end up killing them, it would be a sign from the goddess that she was in the right, which honestly, not the worst plan. Let's talk about Dimitri for a second though. This is the only route in the entire game that he does not have an eye patch. Some of you might say that he's better off in this timeline because of that, because he didn't go in say in this timeline, therefore he didn't lose an eye. However, I think the only reason he's even like this is because he has a church behind him, and it would not look good on him if he just suddenly turned insane, so he's kind of stuck in his academy phase, still hiding his trauma away behind his knightly demeanor. It also makes sense because Rhea is also hot on revenge against someone, so it makes sense that they're very closely allied in Crimson Flower. The Battle of the Tail Teen Plains is Crimson Flower's version of the Battle of Grandra Field. By that, I mean it's a chapter where you fight the most amount of familiar faces. In my opinion, the battle of the Tail Team Plains is even better than the Grander one. This battle is an onslaught of Empire forces going against the Church and Kingdom ones. It takes place basically at the end of the game, so has a much stronger sense of climax than Grander did, and also had stronger character moments. During the battle, despite Dimitri telling him not to, Dedu actually transforms himself into a demonic beast in hopes of beating the Empire. He is not the only one either, several other Kingdom and Church members do the same. This works extremely well because on every other route, you're at the very least on the side of the church, so you never get to see their desperation, you only get to see the empires. But Crimson Flower does a really good job of showing that anyone under the right circumstances will do anything to win in war. The objective of the Battle of the Tail Team Plains is to defeat all the enemy commanders, and these commanders aren't just any people. There are several members of the Blue Lions here, and since you're so close to the end, there is no choice to spare them. This, of course, has the strongest impact on Dimitri. If you have the opinion that Dimitri is better off in Crimson Flower, this should shatter in this next scene. Dimitri is still the same broken man no matter what route you're on, and that begins to show itself here. Dimitri, on his last stand, throws out all the anger he has for Edelgard before dying. He still believes that she caused the tragedy of Dusker, and his hatred is mostly over that. It's unfounded for sure, but with the situation he's in, he can't control it. <coughs> to the fires of eternity with you, El. After their final conversation, Edelgard remembers the time she had with Dimitri, when they were young, and she's definitely shooken up about it, but at this point, she's in too far to stop now. Rhea has retreated back to Ferdiad, so now they're at their final stand. When you finally arrive at Ferdiad, Edelgard will tell you one last time how happy she is that you took her side. She says that you and the other Black Eagles are the only reason she's gotten this far, saying that she probably wouldn't even have won if she didn't have her friends to keep her grounded. After that brief conversation, Talus will come back in and give you some veiled threats about how the Empire and the Agarthans will continue to work together for now, which is obviously code for, I'm gonna try to kill you later. Rhea is at her wit's end. At this point, she's so consumed with rage, she doesn't care about what happens to anyone as long as she can kill Byleth and Edelgard. In fact, she even tells Catherine to set fire to Ferdiad, which will undoubtedly kill a lot of Ferdiad's residents, which is something Edelgard wanted to avoid. Edelgard was even prepared to let the members of Ferdiad leave the city before the battle begins, but now she can't do that. Rhea also transforms into her dragon form here. To Rhea, this is the most personal battle she's ever been. In, and she is prepared to take as many lives as she needs to in the process. The following battle in the burning city of Ferdiad is long and intense. It's a slow march and a long fight. Several people die, and so much of Ferdiad is left to rubble. Eventually, you and Edelgard make your way to Rhea, and after a fury-filled battle, you and Edelgard land the final hit on Rhea, killing her once and for all. 
Edelgard is free to make the world she wants. The crest system can be abolished, and her new reforms can hopefully improve Fodlan. However, if you remember, Rhea is essentially the reason for Byleth even existing. She put the crest of Sothis inside his heart, so upon Rhea's death, Byleth falls over as well. However, this is not a sad end for Byleth, though. Instead of dying, the Crest of Flames merely stops being attached to Byleth's heart, causing it to beat for the very first time. And that is how Crimson Flower concludes. This route might be the shortest of the four, but is still by far one of the best written. Edelgard's entire storyline in Crimson Flower is incredibly well done. For many who play Three Houses, Edelgard is probably a really hard character to like, especially considering the stuff that she does on the other three routes. But I think Crimson Flower does a really good job here humanizing her. This route goes into a lot of the terrible stuff that Edelgard had to deal with when she was a little kid. She was tortured, experimented on, and she's also the daughter of the Emperor, so that is tough on its own. These events, of course, shaped Edelgard's every way of life. It's very clear that these events are the reasons why she wants to go to war. She can't take the slow route, because if she does, more people will be unjustly tormented and tortured. She doesn't want that to happen to anybody, and that's a very understandable thing to think. You understand that the means that Edelgard is going into is at least for a good cause, but Crimson Flower also makes it clear that Edelgard can't do it on her own. She needs trusted allies and friends and family, or else she's gonna lose the human side of her and lose her way. You see on this route that because she has those people at her side, she's much more merciful than she is on other timelines. You are given the option to spare Claude, Sedith, and Flane, where on other routes she wouldn't even consider it. There is even a conversation with Edelgard midway through Crimson and Flower where she talks about wanting to spare Rhea if she can. Crimson Flower also has one of the best central antagonists, Rhea. Similar to Edelgard, she has strong ambitions to be reunited with her long-lost mother. She finally almost got her back when Byleth surfaced up, but it didn't work, and worse still, he chose a side with Edelgard rather than her. How could Byleth, with the heart of her mother literally inside him, choose to fight with someone on the opposite side? Now, the chances of her reunion with her mother are gone, putting her into a mad rage. Rhea is incredibly built up as being the main antagonist as well. She is your main goal to fight ever since you side with Edelgard, and the game builds well on that. Dimitri is also a great antagonist in Crimson Flower, but I've already basically talked about him, so I won't bring it up again. I want to mention again, I think Crimson Flower is really great, but just like with Azur Moon, it has a big misstep when it comes to the Agarthans. Maybe even a bigger one than Azur Moon. The Agarthans are a constant presence within Crimson Flower. After all, this is the only route where you're kind of working together. During conversation with Talus and Crimson Flower, it does a really good job of building up for a future confrontation. And especially learning what they did to Edelgard, it makes you very excited to fight them later on. However, just like with Azur Moon, this never comes, and honestly, it's worse off for it. The game doesn't ignore the Agarthans at the end, however, it's kinda lame how they do it. You are told in the epilogue that the Agarthans are going to war against the Empire, however, you don't actually get to fight against them yourself, you are just told you do, and I think that's kind of lame. Sure, Rhea is built up as the main antagonist, but it's not like those who slither in the dark are kind of side pieces now. They are still a very important piece of the story, and I don't think the pacing would have been that bad if your final boss was the Agarthans rather than Rhea. Crimson Flower is a short route, and I like it for that, but one more chapter wouldn't have been that big of a deal. So I guess I'm just kind of confused why it wasn't in. However, that's just something I'm gonna have to grow to accept. And with that, I have finally covered every single route in Fire Emblem Three Houses. However, I'm still not quite done, and I know I should shut up at this point, but now I think I have to tie everything together. So what is it that tied Three Houses together? Sure, Three Houses has four different timelines, but so what? So many other games have different endings as well. But what's special about Three Houses is how well each of these routes connect to each other. Each of the main characters has their main goals and beliefs, and their own limited perspectives. There are some bits of knowledge that only certain people know, information you can only get by playing their specific route. It is impossible to know every bit of the story on one playthrough. At the beginning of the game, you have to make a choice, and that choice will change how you view the story going forward. Choosing Dimitri might give you a more negative opinion of Edelgard. Same thing with choosing Edelgard might give you a worse opinion on the Church of Saros. With as strong as the character writing for Edelgard, Dimitri, Claude, and Rhea are, for me at least, it was impossible to not get attached to one of them. That one character can shape how you view the rest of the routes. If you play Three Houses in the order of the routes that I went over for this video, you might have a less altered view of the game's events, but I honestly don't even think that's the right way to play. 
The right way to play is whatever you want. In fact, I played the game in the opposite order that I went over. I started with Crimson Flower and ended with Silver Snow. What I really respect about Three Houses is that there's no true ending. Each of the four main characters are very flawed people who are trying to do the right things. Edelgard wants to end injustice with Folin caused by the Crest system. Her morals are strong, but her methods are grey. She turns up with the only objectively evil group in the game, the Agarthans, starting a war that will ravage Folin for five years, and if left unchecked, can become a figurative or literal monster in the process. Dimitri also wants to stop the Crest system, although through slow, gradual changes, and set right what went wrong with the tragedy of Dusker. But if he doesn't have a light to guide him, he will also become a monster, killing indiscriminately, killing in the name of some so-called revenge, and ends up dying in most of the timelines due to it. As Archbishop of the Church of Seros, Rhea is trying to do her best as the leader for her followers. She isn't malicious with the church at all, and generally wants people to be happy. However, her desire to see her mother is so strong that she ends up doing a lot of sketchy stuff, in the worst case, and losing her mind, and any sense of care she had left. Claude... Well, he doesn't fit as well into this, but I've already bullied the Golden Deer enough in this video, so I'll come up with something, even if it's not a perfect fit. Claude wants to end racial tensions between Folin and the other countries. He believes that peace is possible on both sides if they were just able to open up and speak to each other. However, in doing this, he can pull any scheme he wants in order to accomplish this, and he pretty much just ignores the war. I know that sounds pretty harsh, but in every route except his own, he pretty much is just there to join up with whatever side is going to end up winning. Perfectly paired with these morally grey characters, the endings are also all bittersweet. They are all happy in tone and end with Fodlin in a better place, but there is always a catch that makes it not perfect. In order to win for the side of your choice, you're going to have to fight a lot of people you used to be friends with, and oftentimes it's impossible to avoid them. It's war. It's regrettable, but they have to die. Yeah, on a first playthrough, it might not hit as hard, as you're just fighting someone you didn't get to talk to. Like, oh yeah, I had to fight Hanuman, or Ferdinand, or Dorothea, or Felix, but it's not that big of a deal, I didn't really get to talk to them much. But on repeat playthroughs, it hits just so much more. On subsequent playthroughs, you'll obviously be going with a different house, so you eventually have to fight the people that you had on your first playthrough. You got to know these people, and you even have a few favorites. Sure, you have the chance to recruit them, but you probably won't be able to recruit all of them. Each of these characters you're fighting have their aspirations and goals just like the main four, and when you kill them, they go up in smoke. Unlike other games where the commanders are just random evil people, it doesn't feel good to kill these guys. They're not just random evil spooky bad guys, they're real characters in the story who are trying to do what they think is right. That makes every route you do have a tad bit of melancholy, because no matter what, you have to fight at least a few of them. A lot of them, if you're on Crimson Flower, as even though it's the shortest route, you end up fighting most of the students in the game. This even applies to the unnamed enemies as well. They feel much more real in this scenario, because although you don't personally know them, they could have a family and aspirations as well that you're just ending in the name of some greater cause. And again, there is no true ending here. I think Three Houses is one of the most interesting games to talk about because it handles player bias so well. I'm not even going to pretend like I'm not biased at least a little bit towards events in the game. I definitely am to some extent, even if I try to stay impartial. As you can see by the long length of this video, Three Houses is such a fun game to discuss because there's just so many levels to it. Although on the internet, you might find some more aggressive discussion, but I still think it works really well because it causes people to think about their own perceptions. I have played a decent amount of games where a war is the main focus of the narrative. Out of all of those games, I definitely think that Three Houses has the best portrayal of it. All sides of the war are trying to do what they think is best. They will often go to extreme measures to make sure they're right, but the people who end up winning the war will always be in the right for their mind, so it's up to you to decide who. Which ideals do you want to make a reality, and which will you snuff out forever? Upon starting another run on whatever playthrough you're on, you're making the choice right at the beginning. So, the question remains, which house do you want to choose? Edelgard's, Dimitri's, or Claude's?
Oh, by the way, did I mention there's DLC? Let's just get this cat out of the bag right away. I have opted to largely ignore the DLC in this video. It's not like I don't like the DLC, I actually like it a lot. The four characters that the DLC introduces are very great. There are some cool new monastery features that are added, as well as a pretty lengthy side story that is fun in terms of both gameplay and interesting in terms of the game's lore. However, this story is mostly standalone. It doesn't really feed into the main plot at all, so although the DLC is great, I don't feel the need to get into it deep at all, especially considering the already monstrous video that this has become. Anyway, I am finally done going over my thoughts on Three Houses. This is a three hour video, so I'm just gonna quickly summarize because I feel that is necessary. Three Houses is a phenomenal experience and my favorite game of all time. It is definitely not a game without its issue, especially when it comes to the presentation and some major story details. But even with that, the story on hand is so well told, it doesn't really even matter. The gameplay is definitely not the best I've played in the genre, but it is addicting, which is extremely important considering this is a game you definitely have to play three times to fully understand the story. And by far the best thing about this game is its great character writing. And with that, I want to thank you so much for watching this video, especially if you watch the entire thing. This video has been a long time coming. I've actually had this planned for over a year, but work on this video couldn't begin until November. I wanted to make this video because I made my first 30 minute video on Persona 5, and I figured I should at least do a 30 minute video on Three Houses as well, because it's my favorite game and I'd never really done a full retrospective on the game. However, two separate times during the process, the scope of this video has completely exceeded what I originally thought it was going to be. Believe it or not, before I wrote the script for this video, I estimated it would be around 48 minutes. And even after I fully wrote the script, I still only expected it to be a little less than two hours. And of course, as you can see on your screen, that did not end up happening. Obviously, I have a very minuscule following on YouTube, but just in case you are a fan of the channel and wondering where I was, here I am. I haven't been taking a break since my last video, I've been working on this the entire time. If I include the amount of time it took to play the game again to get footage for this video, I spent around 200 hours on this project in the last 3 months or so. I know I said in my last video that I wanted to get this video out in February, and I'm sorry I'm a few days late, but I honestly could not get it done before that. But regardless, I really hope you enjoyed it. I really hope this video is good and does justice to my favorite game, or who knows, maybe it's a piece of crap. I guess time will tell with that. Before I finally finish the video, there are a couple quick things I want to talk about. First off, this past February was the two-year anniversary of making my first video for this channel. I think I've definitely gotten better since my first video, and I'd like to thank everyone in my life for supporting me. Secondly, with this project, I haven't been able to get monthly uploads of the past couple of months, but hopefully that will change, and April, I can post a video on Persona 3 Reload. But again, time will tell. One last time, thank you so much for watching, I really mean it, and I'll see you all next time.